That's our cue, Hello. sir. Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Open Bar 33, so we're fairly claiming up now. And we're going to be doing it a lot quicker now because we're doing it every week. My it's a weekly God. thing. My God, I don't know if my liver can handle this. 52 a week? Can you, Well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could try and do 52 a week if you want. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Crazy things have been done, so maybe... Mm. Well, you've, this is a guy who's done 24-hour EFAP, so that is a lot of fapping. That's true. But uh, you guys did it. I don't know how you managed it, because it's like a couple hours of EFAP, and I'm uh, and I'm kind of fucked by the, the end of it. But uh, hey, you know, glad you did it. Four times. Fifth time is on its way already. It's ridiculous. Oh, damn. But yeah, we, we've uh, got a few things to cover tonight. Um, we can have a good old laugh at the Golden Globes. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Worst ratings ever, apparently. And, uh, well, we need some gentlemen to do this with, so should we bring some guests in? Let's do it. All right, do it. All right, we've got Nick Rakita. Hello, sir. Hey, what's up, guys? It's good to have you back, man. It's been a while. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's been a bit, but I'm happy. I'm loaded. I've got uh, I've got this bottle of uh, Blue Run Kentucky Straight Golden uh, Rye Whiskey. Damn, that looks good. Oh. I hear it's good for you, so excellent. Yeah, well, it it keeps uh, all of the government diseases away. <laughs> a, a <bottle laughs> like day like keeps... the IRS. <laughs> Wait, are they not getting abolished now or something? Are you guys not voting to abolish them? Oh, God, it would be so funny. <laughs> I just wish, like, just defund the IRS. Just get rid of them. It, did, it kind of made me wonder, like, how do you pay for things then? Who pays for, like, the army and stuff to like, defend Who America? <laughs> the, uh, they'll just the volunteer. Army, the army's like, uh... It's it's all pretend anyway. Like all the money's pretend. I don't know why they even bother taking it from us. They just print it whenever they want it, so it doesn't nice. matter. Yeah, yeah. It's like oh fuck it. Never bother with tax. We'll just print more money. Can't see that going wrong. <laughs> we just hang on to monopoly money, okay? Because just tax us yeah. through uh, hyperinflation. It'll be fine. <laughs> pay, pay for everything with Dogecoin. Say it's worth like ten billion a coin. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It'd, work. It'd be like NFTs. We just pay in NFTs. Just pictures of money. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my hundred dollar bill NFT. You have my picture of like an ape fucking a, a bear. It's like yeah, this, this <laughs> is worth worth a, a trillion dollars right there. <laughs> uh, we've also got Echo Chamberlain. Hello, sir. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. It's uh, it's ten a.m. where I am. So even by my debauched standards, I'm not going to be drinking. I'm just going to be sticking to my coffee. I can kind Ooh. of understand that, yeah. But if this goes past twelve. 12 o'clock, uh, yeah, Probably you can get cracking. Yeah. Then it's socially acceptable, so it's all right. Um, yeah, good to see yeah. you all. Um, yeah, I saw with um, now the Republicans are in charge of the House, they've got the they've got to raise the debt ceiling, and if they don't, then it causes a, like a, the global economy to melt down. So this is this chat, like this dumb idea that they can get around it by printing uh, a trillion dollar coin <laughs> as a way to, uh, to prevent a, a default. So that would be so awesome if someone could just hold up a trillion dollar coin. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth one trillion dollars. It's made of graphene. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, did, uh, was there not an episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns has got like a billion dollar bill or something like, and that everyone's hunting for it? And, oh, I can't uh, remember. I'm sure the CIA were like, yeah, well, we've had him under satellite surveillance, but all we could determine is that he doesn't have it on his roof. <laughs> 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 Uh, but yeah, well, I was going to start off with this uh, this charming bit of news because you know we we love uh, we love Hollywood, you know, and we love Yay. to see them succeed. And so it's always good when they do these annual award shows where they they pat each other on the back and they they sm sniff each other's farts. And uh, the Golden Globes is one of them. Um, not doing so well though, sadly. <laughs> they uh, they've recorded their lowest ratings of all time. Um, yeah, I'll go and I'll, I'll read the article actually from Deadline. So, um, yeah, the Golden Globes returned to broadcast television this year, not with a bang, but with a whimper. 
Uh, at NBC's Tuesday night telecast of the 80th annual Cerame brought in just 6.3 million people, according to Nielsen Ooh. data. It marks the lowest audience ever for the Golden Globe ceremony, which had already plummeted to just 6.9 million last year. That was barely a third of the size of 2020's 18.3 million. Last year's ceremony wasn't televised, uh, following revelations about a lack of diversity and allegations of impropriety. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah nobody's watching the golden globes anymore i mean what can you say like if you keep producing garbage and and uh, treating your fans like shit people aren't going to tune in for it what can i say can't you I, I just can't wait i can't wait for that scene where like they're all sitting in the golden globes you know maybe like two years from now no one's watching no one's even like present who's not nominated for an award don't they love us i mean they love us right Right, like, it's going to be no. It's going to be. <laughs> what they'll do is they'll stream it straight to YouTube instead of broadcasting it, and it'll be yeah. like it'll be like DSP. It's like oh, we've, we've raised ten dollars <laughs> in super chats this session. Come on, we need to get to fifty. <laughs> well, guys, if we don't get up to uh, at least eighty dollars in the next twenty minutes, uh, we're not going to be opening the next award. We're just not going to be able to do it. <laughs> um, I I just I don't know why you guys don't want to see the next award being open. It's really. I mean, it's not really fair. You sitting there watching the show and not contributing to it, but um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, might as well, be in, the, uh, might sure as well be in the witness protection program. And so, how much viewers they've got now? <laughs> I know. I mean, it's just uh, well, this is the thing. You know, the you know, it's an entirely self inflicted wound, isn't it? Like this is a an award ceremony, like every other one in Hollywood. That uh, mm -hmm. everything is political. Everyone who gets up stage to accept an award. You know, decides that they're going to make this their their platform for like whatever socio political cause that they they think is popular at the time. Uh, they want to lecture everyone about um, you know how they they need to do better and how they need to um, save the environment, stop using their gas stoves and stuff while they jet around on on private planes and stuff <laughs> like. <laughs> how 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 long do you think you can keep peddling this line of nonsense before people just say? Nah, this is this is idiotic. I'm not accepting this anymore. I would be the worst rich person because, like, the whole private plane thing. I was. <clears throat> you're all talking about the private planes and shaming and stuff. I would have a private plane to go to the grocery store. Like, I would fly <laughs> everywhere. It would be so cool to have a like a pilot and a staff plane to take you wherever you want to go. I would be such a bad steward of that. <laughs> you know what I would do? I would have a private jet, but I wouldn't actually fly it. I would drive it along the road. <laughs> yeah. Just like, like waiting in traffic and stuff. And then... <laughs> Waving out the windows at people and stuff. <laughs> Look, you, look, common folk. You're taxiing yeah. into Walmart. <laughs> Just like throwing caviar at them and stuff. Like, ah, yeah. peasants back. Did, did you guys hear what the... I would so have a have... gas-guzzling uh, helicopter to take me to the, <laughs> the landing tank for my uh, jet. Tie it to the top of the jet and have the rotors going, you know, yeah. while you're driving down the road. The jet um, takes you to the jet. That could be, yeah. <laughs> Did you guys see, uh, so FTX, that whole, like, crazy FTX scandal, and, like, the documents came out about the expenditures that they did? The FTX employees, they're on, like, an island um, south off the coast of Florida, and, uh, and what they would do is they'd have packages delivered to a P.O. box in Miami, and they would send the jet from the island to Miami to pick up the package, and then they'd just fly the package back to the island. Like, they wouldn't even go themselves. They'd just send the <laughs> plane, and then, like, like, a DHL guy get, hands the delivery to the plane guy, to the pilot, and then they'd just fly back to the island. That's the type of money spending I would want to do. I'd be the I'd be the worst, best rich person. When yeah. Greta Thunberg came up, I'd be like, get on the plane. I don't know. Where you want to go? I'll, yeah, take we'll you to, <laughs> I'll take you somewhere and throw you into the ocean. It'll be fine. <laughs> Commie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, th this, you know, this decline in ratings that we've seen, right, for the Golden Globes, this has been across the board with every major awards ceremony. The Oscars of of gone through the exactly the same thing um, for yeah. a lot of the same reasons. You know, people have been turned off by actors or I was going to call them activists, you know, slip of the tongue and all that. Um, you know, and the, the whole the whole culture of Hollywood, like the only reason that uh, people were talking about the last Oscars was because of Will Smith slapping the shit out of Chris Rock. <laughs> that was it, though. But like, if it hadn't been for that, it would have just been an absolute snoozathon that nobody would have really tuned in for. And, 
Yeah, I think we're all old enough here to remember when the Oscars was a big deal. Like, it was quite an exciting thing to tune into. You know, you were you were interested to see who won. You were interested to see all the nominations, like the hosts. The whole the whole event was quite important, or interesting at least. Now it's just... A, uh, used to be a family event. Uh, one is that... Um, back in the day you didn't see these celebrities very often so if jack nicholson came out on the stage it was oh wow it's jack nicholson and he had you know yeah the yeah well of music and everything and the other thing is i think just this year the quality of films isn't really that great um and i think that's another factor that's playing into it uh, this like era, if you think this of generation back, almost isn't it yeah. yeah um i just think it's an average year for filmmaking and there's no clear front runner um for the best film that i can think of Avatar. I mean, I, I don't even watch anything. What uh, Top Gun? Sorry, Mahler. <laughs> no, I just said Avatar. That's all. Oh, oh really? <laughs> the front runner, best movie. Because like, I'm sure there'll be people out there who'll be like, "Yeah, it's the best movie because it made the most money." So of course it's the best. <laughs> you know? All right, there you go. We did it. I sort of put yeah, a, uh, sort of bit of Angela Bassett on the uh, the Golden Globes. Um, there's a little so, teeny bit of a disconnect. You know, yes, she's regal and imperious and serene and gracious but you you know you were in a comic book film you know there's a little it, bit of a it, it's a tough one because you kind of have to look at her por like her performance in isolation it's like okay did she do a good acting performance and you know yeah i i think for me she was the best thing in wakanda forever like i think mm -hmm. she genuinely gave it her all and she really went for it but it's almost sad because it's like the material you're working with is so shit. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like I kind of respect the fact that, like, even though she probably knew as an actor that, like, this film wasn't particularly good, the script was kind of rubbish, but she resolved to give it her all. It's like, well, that's kind of commendable. So I respect that. And she did give a good performance. Um, we the... about two years, and that script went through like five significant major changes, didn't it? It was, it was changed like five times, probably obviously due to uh, Chadwick dying, but also just other fuckery that happens with production. So she probably knew all of that as well. It's, it, I think it's, so, it's yeah. It's hard to be invested when that's happening. Uh, I, and so it, there's always a part of you that just feels automatically bad for good actors in bad movies, you know, who, who yeah. still are too professional not to do their best with it. Yeah. <laughs> so but I, I respect to be it. Trying to almost, she seems to be almost trying to like imbue the film with a gravitas that it's just not designed to have. That's kind I, of I think idea. so. I, I would liken it to Raul Julia in Street Fighter. <laughs> it's like you've got a really good actor. We're <laughs> working with terrible material, just really going for it, you know? Just like, give it your best, son. Good one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, out of every actress across the movie spectrum in the whole year, like, was she the best? I don't know about that. Like, surely there's got to be other, you know, other contenders. Yeah, Jennifer Lawrence, surely. Well, I mean, Jennifer Lawrence invented the Golden Globes and the Oscars and movies, but... So explain to me why isn't she winning every category, then? What's going on? I, I think, yeah... Best animated film, Jennifer Lawrence, obviously. <laughs> I, I don't know. There maybe just needs to be a, a special category for her, like best Jennifer Lawrence performance <laughs> as Jennifer Lawrence or something. I don't know. Some people call like that unfair. I think it's right. That's what yeah, like being I think the time is right. Uh, yeah, like a picture of being John Malkovich seen like in a restaurant where she's literally everyone at every table. Yeah, yeah. and everyone just says Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or no, Lawrence it would have to be. But yeah, Michelle Yeoh in Everything Everywhere. Um, really good performance. Loved Did you see that, that clip where they try and play music to send her off, stop the speech, and she says, shut up? <laughs> no, I didn't see that. She yeah. says, shut up, and then she looks the person, I guess, off to the yeah. right and says, I could beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> really? She's yeah, probably right humble as well. Pianist, you know? I think she probably could. She's pretty that. good. She's, uh, yeah, she's got, some she's got some muscle going on. It's uh, It was quite distracting when I was watching Wakanda Forever. It's like, aren't you like 80 years old or something? How are you built <laughs> like this? I don't understand. But yeah. Um, God, that shit. was... So it makes me think about Michelle Yeoh popping up in Blood Origin for some reason. <laughs> like that's just something that happened. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't blame you. Um, well, this is the thing she can do. Things. Well, yeah, she can do amazing things like Everything Everywhere, but then she can also do absolute garbage like Star Trek Discovery and uh, yeah and Witcher. And it's like, does, does she just I'm have not, a terrible I'm agent, not, or uh, is it just purely like yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get paid a lot of money for this, so what the hell, I'll do it. 
I'm trying to imagine her agent, you know, trying to convince her, saying it's uh, it's The Witcher, it's really super popular. Uh, this is going to be it's going to take you a career in a great new direction. And she's like, uh, I don't know, maybe okay. And then she finds herself in this horrible turkey of a project. Yeah, because I think and, I can understand yeah. a lot of the other actors because it's like they're kind of nobodies, and so like any opportunity mm -hmm. like this is probably going to seem like a good one. But it's like you're Michelle Yeoh, like you've been in some fantastic movies. You're an established actress, like. You you shouldn't really need this, <laughs> like you shouldn't have to stoop to this level. I don't know. Maybe it seemed better on the on the page rather than like when they started shooting it or something. Yeah, it's a shame because you kind of think about it like, oh, I guess Henry Cavill had that same problem, right? He ends up in because he still got some stuff that works out, like Fallout. That was good, right? <laughs> Did you ever yeah. see that? But so, then he's, you know, wait, he's, there's a he's, Fallout movie. No, no, no. Uh, Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible Fallout. Fallout. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. But then it's like, yeah, I think the problem with that one is like, he's he's ultimately just the antagonist in it, and, uh, you know... I almost wish they didn't kill him, because I'd happily have him back. Fuck it. I would, yeah. But I think we're, we're kind of like that with Henry, where it's just like, I just want to see him in, in yeah. good stuff. <laughs> you know, anything. Just anything. Give Henry Fuck a it, role. Make him a zombie in the Mission Impossible <laughs> universe. I don't care anymore. Why they don't want him to be in anything. They're they're just uh, allergic to pleasing the audience in any way. They have to show the audience that what they like is wrong, and that what they should like is better. And so when they find out, it's like, oh, I really like this Henry Cavill chap. He's kind of fun and entertaining. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa! We can't have that. No, get out, get out of all of our properties. Go do something else, please. Uh, like leave the internet and leave leave popular culture, because we we don't want people to enjoy what they're doing. I don't think they I wanted think that, him to leave Witcher though. They're kind of desperate for him on that. Was, uh, I thought he was out. Like already. that's what I'm saying. Like he was originally <clears throat> he was gonna stay for the you know the whole thing, but after what the two years because he's done one more now. It's just like no oh, fuck this. I'm out. Like which makes a lot of sense because they've just shot all over it. Has he ever gotten anywhere near to like an ideal role where he can really express himself? that he's truly capable of like everything seems way <laughs> far away from that thing like even I mean, he, in, was in like, he was like he was he was like he was, was so designed to play wouldn't. superman but it's like you know they just wouldn't they wouldn't use him properly like so he's just been shit movie after shit movie unfortunately he's so weirdly underutilized like in mission impossible he was so stiff and wooden it was a, a weird choice uh that he was doing tonally so he's so far away from actually Getting that role that we know he's sort of capable of. It's weird. All these bits and pieces that he does. Yeah. What do you yeah, guys think like, about uh, the for the upcoming 40K franchise with him? Please be good. Please be good. Please be good. Please be good. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've said, I've, I've, <clears throat> people have asked me about this before, and it's like, on the one hand, I'm excited that he's getting to do a project that he's clearly passionate about, and like, I'm sure if he gets creative control over it, he'll make it pretty pretty faithful to the lore. Right. But on the other hand, I'm like, I don't see it being a massive commercial success because 40k is just quite a niche thing. You know, I just feel like a lot of people aren't really going to get it. They're not, they're not going to buy into it. And it's probably going to be popular, but like a cult following almost. So yeah, they're going to have to find some way to sell this ridiculous look and aesthetic to, uh, to the world. And they got to be really careful with it. Um, I, although I've heard that they're doing the Eisenhorn uh, storyline, and if that's the case, I think they have really good potential because it's basically like just a, a detective story, right? And um, it's not as uh, Bolter pornish, so maybe people will be uh, a little bit open to it and kind of just the ludicrous characters well, and the the big grandiose setting. Because I think if you're gonna um, do like Space Marines that are like eight feet tall and weigh like four hundred pounds each, and you know, like. <laughs> Uh, the 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 rock and iron and power armor. You're gonna need an enormous budget for all the CGI and stuff. And yeah, it's just gonna be a tough sell. Like they're giving us uh, Gears and God of War as well, right? Like they're both getting adaptations. So yeah, we're gonna, but, uh, all three of the franchises he... can be absurd and ridiculous. So I don't know. Well, maybe they're opening things up. Is, is it true that they've cast Batista as Kratos? I thought it was Batista is is uh, in gears. I don't think Batista is. They're just thinking about it or whatever for uh, right. I don't think like, he should be Kratos. No, I mean it's almost like well, he can act to some extent, and he's got big muscles, so that seems to be like the 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 
thinking behind it, but it's like, uh, I don't know, he just seems to be appearing in loads of things, but I don't really understand why he keeps getting cast, because well, yeah, like, he's not an actor. Glass like Onion, 50? didn't Ryan Johnson say he's the best actor that came from wrestling or whatever? And people were like, well, that's, that's not a, many people. That's a low benchmark. <laughs> like, that's that's yeah. up against Hulk Hogan and, and yeah, of course, yeah. John Hulk Cena. Hulk Hogan, The Rock, John Cena. Yeah, you're like, there's not that many. And they're not like, nobody thinks of these people as like the most amazing actors or ever. So it was, a, it was a weird, I was like, is that an insult or a compliment? <laughs> like, you're one of the greatest actors that came from wrestling. <laughs> well, how come? Why didn't the Macho Man have a film career? That's my first question. Uh, which one I mean, he got a role in Spider Man, didn't man, he? Yeah. <laughs> and the second thing is, Henry Cavill shouldn't he be doing like Michael Fassbender kind of stuff, like serious dramatic roles, like that kind of thing? Shouldn't he be we playing should be doing all kinds of things? things? Yeah. Um, Cavill's a nerd, though. I actually think that he's very invested in mm. being able to act in like IPs he's familiar and enjoys, because uh, he likes DC as well, right? I assume. At least, you know. Well, I, I'd hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like, it's like, I've taken on the role of Superman, but I fucking hate him. God damn sort of it. At this point, like, he, I, th we, this is why everyone feels bad for him. It's just like all these IPs he's probably familiar with and enjoys that he keeps having to play these retarded adaptations of them. So it's like, <laughs> it's your own personal th hell. He's doing a, yeah, yeah. Seriously, he's doing a Thanos now. He's like, fine, I'll do it myself with <laughs> the 40K or whatever. It's like, best of luck to him, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, it's with with Cavo, like we've obviously talked quite a bit about it before, but he's like the most underutilized actor in Hollywood. It's just been a series of false starts for him um, or roles that he can't really do anything with. So yeah, I just have to hope they'll eventually find that that one golden project that really launches him. But yeah, yeah who knows? Um, but yeah, I, I know we before we were starting this we'd uh we talked a little bit about ant-man 3 because i think we've all seen the trailer it's just yeah. come out um and i have to admit i was kind of surprised um it doesn't look like a, a typical marvel current movie where everything's about making jokes They're and lying to you drinker it, it could no fucking be way that this all is going to be stuffed with jokes it's it's not it's not just a marvel movie it's a fucking paul rudd movie like this is yeah, and like if that's the case, then whoever cut this trailer together and somehow made it look like a serious movie with actual stakes deserves some kind of Oscar because it genuinely makes it look halfway competent. It looks like a serious story where it's like, oh shit, like this could be it for Ant Man. It looks like there's something at play here. You know, you've got Kang in it who actually looks kind of threatening as a villain. And I thought, yeah, they, they did a pretty good job with this. Have they somehow learned their lesson? Have they no. have they decided to make it more like more Did you see fucking Modoc? <laughs> Very briefly. But yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, it, well, it's think, weird uh... as, you know it's weird because they basically cut the wasp out of it almost completely. Versus like the original um teaser. Where it was like the wasp, and it was um, what was uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's character? Oh, I don't remember her name, the, but the, yeah, the original wasp essentially. Uh, it seemed to be really focused on both of them and his daughter. You know, she's she's invented a quantum gateway thing because that's the thing that teenage girls do all the time. You know, in their <laughs> spare time. Um, you know, but like this time around, it's like wow, it's actually focused on Ant Man himself as a character. Wow, it's almost like he gets to like. Be in his own movie. That's a that's a revolutionary idea at this point. Hmm. Well, the uh, the thing I liked about the other Ant Man movies is they did like it, Mueller's right. It, it is a Paul Rudd movie, so it's gonna have jokes and stuff. But it felt like that was okay. Like the they they played into the character just fine. He played, uh, you know, he played up the jokes. But the entire movie was still semi serious in the way that a comic book would be, where you're. It's ridiculous that he's riding on the back of an ant and it's huge, right? Like that's a ludicrous sort of visual, but it still kind of fit everything that was going on. So I have hope, man, uh, that that it'll maybe be not shit, but <laughs> I don't have faith. I just have hope. This faith is, the, is dead. This is the <laughs> opening of phase five, right? So it's going to set the tone, so to speak. I don't know. We'll see. I take this I mean, from the perspective of I'm not like a big Marvel aficionado, so I look at this from the view of it's a cool basic concept that you shouldn't monkey around with, where you just have a guy who shrinks down and has crazy misadventures. 
But then I had to look up what the quantum realm is, and I had to write it down. <laughs> I mean, the quantum this, yeah. realm is a minuscule dimension that can only be entered through subatomic particles whose time vortexes can be used to travel to alternate <laughs> universes within the multiverse, oh, as was done in no. order to reverse the blip and defeat the Chronicoms. Why can't you just have a guy who shrinks down and has crazy adventures? Why do you have I, I think this... Stuff? Yeah, I think the thing that bothers me as well is like... When when they talk about the quantum realm, I I kind of imagine it as this weird otherworldly place where like the laws of time and space don't exist and like you know it's it's crazy because it's like super tiny subatomic world that you're you're existing in, but then you see it and it seems to have like cities and an infrastructure and just like people who fly around in spaceships Taxes. and stuff and like yeah and like yeah <laughs> like sit down and, and eat food and stuff. There's like a whole ecosystem of of life forms there, like. It's just essentially the normal world, but small. Like, how, out, how, is, how is that interesting? Turns out that Herman Cain didn't die. He just went to the quantum realm and implemented <laughs> his small tax policy. <laughs> tax is going to be all, flat and small. We all end up Herman in the quantum Cain, realm. that's a deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> didn't but, he uh, die? Didn't he pass away? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. quantum realm, no. He's in the quantum realm now. <laughs> implementing oh, I'm his fair about tax. American politician. Uh... The, the thing about the trailer, um, it does that thing, which is becoming like very generic now, where it takes like a, a classic song, in this case, Yellow Brick Road, and it starts off as normal. And then just like yeah. in, um, in Matrix Revolutions, where you had that song, White Rabbit, mm. or in um, Something in the Way in The Batman, it starts off normal. And by the end of the trailer, it's pounding you with these waves of orchestral synths yeah. and things that... Uh, that gets yeah, that's how they give it gravitas, though. <laughs> Yes. Very current thing, isn't it? With all like movie trailers now, it's like let's pick a the, song from between 1971 and 1987 yeah. and slow it down a whole lot and and put it in a minor key. It'll be great. Yeah, and there'll be one note at the beginning, and there'll be a black screen <laughs> like do yeah, 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 the yeah. start of yeah. whatever the song oh, is. And you're like, <gasps> it's like it when every uh... for... sorry, it must be difficult. Um... Like if you see the film, you've never heard the song before, and then you go back and listen to the original song. It must be kind of underwhelming because it doesn't rise to this grand crescendo of mass sense. <laughs> it's like when they used to have in every action movie the air horns on like like oh, all yeah. of them. Like, okay, <laughs> we, we know who's cutting all of the, the theatrical trailers <laughs> this week. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, was like uh, Inception and Prometheus, I remember starting that off big time. Yeah. Yeah, that was it was just the inception bong, wasn't it? And it just became yep. the thing that everyone did. Um, but yeah, it's I don't know, man. It's it's a weird situation that we're in now, where Ant Man, who was like the the least relevant and the, the, like pretty much the least interesting of all the Avengers characters, is suddenly like the hope for resurrecting the MCU. It's like this movie is the one that's going to kick off the entire phase. Like, damn, you know, times have it does changed. Feel weird. You know? Especially being like, how many characters even have three movies that are solos? And it's like, well, you got Cap, Iron Man, uh, Thor. Uh, no, Doctor Strange hasn't even got it. It's like Black Widow didn't. She only got one. You know, like Hawkeye didn't get any. <laughs> it's like, yeah, Ant Man is literally like next in line, almost for. T but like, uh, you know, no offense, but it just comes across. He doesn't even feel like he's fully integrated yet. He still feels like he's struggling to even be an Avenger or whatever. And then you're like, wait a minute, who even are the Avengers? And you're like, I don't even know, man. They're figuring that out at some point. <laughs> and it's like, does There's he have authority? Does he have chemistry with any of these characters? And like, probably not. And it's I like, mean, and so I, what are we doing? Really really is he dying? Job, that's that's another question. They gave him a really important job. Like, that's that's kind of the funny thing. I mean, like, if not for Ant Man, right? Like, the whole thing would have they they needed to to have Ant Man to do all the time traveling. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's like, you're right, though, there's like barely interaction, there's no chemistry with any of the characters, yet they gave him like the most important job. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, no, I can solve this. Like, who the hell are you? Uh, he was I, pretty, he was in Civil War also. He had a, he, man, it was, and like his whole role there was like to be a fanboy, and it's like he can't believe that he's like interacting yeah. with Captain America and stuff. And it's like, okay, it's kind of funny. But it, it, again, it's playing on the fact that he's just this absolute nobody. Um, well, it doesn't feel like he just... hasn't moved on from that, does it? He's still no. kind of that. It, it, like, you know this film's probably going to make fun of him a decent amount as well. Might actually take him seriously slightly more so with that new trailer, I... but I don't know. 
I, I guess part of the problem as well is like his second movie essentially wasn't his movie. It was it was the Wasps movie and her mother. Like that was the entire thrust narrative. Yeah, he was dragged film. around throughout that whole narrative. Yeah, and he was just kind of a background character in his own film. And it's like, well, that doesn't really help the audience to like bond with this character and get invested in him. Because I mean, it's like, like, I want to see an Ant Man at this point who's like very confident and almost getting to the point where he can lead. You know, instead of, whoa, what am I going to do about this situation? Whoa, yeah. which is fine. Have me, like, out as a norm, have me out as a normie here, but um, in the original Ant Man films, he shrinks down, and that's the gimmick and, and the fun thing about it. So, surely the one thing you wouldn't do is take someone who's well, that's your main thing and you put them into a quantum realm where the dimensions are uncertain and you don't know which, you know, the scope or scale of things. And so, you're taking away the one cool thing about that character a little bit. Am I wrong about that? Even well, though I think he's in the quantum realm, you'll be shrinking and growing. But the thing is, everyone else will too. Yeah, so it undermines yeah. the whole point, the whole cool thing about him. I, I, I think that was something I did notice in that trailer was, the, you know, all the like multiple Ant Man and the fact that like there can be a giant one, but he's getting like spaghettified and stuff. And it's like, this is now, uh, again, much like with uh, Multiverse of Madness, it's a world where there's like no rules and there's no limitations mm -hmm. to anything that can happen at any time, which does worry me. Like, well, okay. Well, so, uh, just on that note, right? Because I brought up how he might even die, and then there's people like, well, no, he's not going to die. He's set to be in uh, whatever Avengers movie. And it's like, no, 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 he can die. They can all die. They're in the multiverse. So they'll just respawn or they'll reassemble or they'll run back time. They've already done that. So, go grab was... another one. Yeah, that's what you're saying about stakes, right? It's just everything's fucked now. Nothing, there are no stakes for anything. Do you think they'll get, I don't know, Scarlett Johansson back or like Robert Downey Jr. back? Or... As far as I'm concerned, the, the definite death and desperation of the MCU is when we see Robert Downey Jr. return as Iron Man, even for five seconds. That's when you know it's like, oh, it's fucked. Well, isn't he Iron <laughs> Deficiency <laughs> Man now that he's vegan? <laughs> he he looks legit ill. Like, the pictures terrible. that I've seen of him, he, he looks like ah, he but... weighs about five stone, and yeah, he's like, his Dude, hair's gone Dude, it'll get to great. the point, though, that he'll, he'll film his scenes on, like, fucking Zoob with a green screen behind <laughs> it, and he'll do the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Hooked up to his IV to keep him alive. <laughs> Well, they'll do. Yeah, I could be. I wouldn't be surprised if they did it with fucking AI, and that he just pays for the gets paid for the likeness or something. It's it's That's so where sad. Act it's going. It's the, the next two Avengers movies. They're going to be filled with crazy multiverse stuff. We can expect literally. I'm half expecting Ben Affleck's Daredevil to show up at this point. <laughs> oh god! I pay to see that. Could be funny. It'll be like, like a two pack hologram kind of deal. I think the next couple of years. What yeah. if they brought in every iteration of the Punisher? Like just all of them. Well, the, got in the there. Dolph Lundgren version and stuff. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Ray uh, Stevenson, the, yeah. Tom Jane. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. They're, they're they're all there, and they just I don't know. They just go kill some. Like they go take out the cartels or whatever. They just like, have just, all have a mini good each. Just shred some, you know, <laughs> kingpin alternate thing. See, this just makes me sad thinking about like the the Netflix you know era of MCU heroes like Daredevil and Punisher, all that sort of thing. And just like, oh god, there's a Daredevil show coming out, isn't there? Yep. Uh, it's gonna be good though. It's gonna be fun. No, it's don't worry. Not, it's gonna, man. it's gonna be funny. <laughs> it's gonna be Marvelized, so that you know, every every third line is a joke, and we can just and have they a laugh. nailed it, man. Like Daredevil was a decent show. Punisher was a decent show. Like these were fun to watch. Uh, I don't know they how really they really did, did nail it. Yeah. And, and they, they're gonna, they're just gonna, they're gonna shit it up. It's all Guardians of the Galaxy's fault, I think, personally. Cause that was, that was like good. They pulled off like the balance of comedy and comic bookiness, uh, in my opinion, really well. And then they like started to try and do that everywhere. And it's like not every movie is Guardians of the Galaxy. And it doesn't have to be. It's okay. We can have dark stuff. Um, not like DC, where everything has to be dark and broody, like an episode of Angel. Or whatever, listening to uh, emo <laughs> music in the background, but like sometimes we could do it, and that's what I liked about. That's what I've liked about so many of the older Marvel movies, and or or even stuff in the Marvel universe, and not the MCU, but like Logan and stuff like that, and Daredevil, and uh, and what the hell, uh, Deadpool. Like they could branch out, and even the first Ant Man. Like it's a heist movie uh, within the Marvel universe. Like that's that's fun. Like set. 
set these movie tropes that we understand. Make a film noir. Make a make an action comedy. Make a buddy comedy. Make a romance movie. I don't care. Like uh, do do a romantic comedy or whatever you want to do. But the Marvel universe gives them flexibility. But they're trying to like homogenize every single thing to look like the same damn show or the same damn movie yeah. everywhere. I, I don't get this attitude at all. They made a law one. It was great. Didn't you see it? <laughs> yeah. it was you, as a lawyer, you must have been blown away by how yeah. accurate She-Hulk was. You know, Mahler, I did watch that. And there's one person on Earth I blame for all of the pain that I suffered doing that. The worst news about the fact that there won't be a season two is I can't force you to watch it. <laughs> that was so bad. I, oh. I think, though, this... this you know skewing towards humor like it was a slow creeping thing in some ways like it was just hey like people are responding really well to the occasional glib joke and like witty observation that we put into our scripts like let's do more of that and like yeah. that just gets stacked up movie upon movie tv show upon tv show um and and they don't kind of know when to rein it in but then you also get movies like Ragnarok, which just went full in for the comedy. It's like, we're just going to take this and make it into a farce now. And again, it did pretty well financially. And that convinced them that, hey, like people just want to laugh at these characters. They're just fun. Like, we just want to we just want to have fun with it and not take anything seriously. Uh, and that's why you ended up with Love and Thunder. Ugh. Yeah, because like, it really felt like they're, they're never willing to let the audience sit on a sad emotion for any longer than like a few seconds. They're like, ooh, ooh, ooh careful. We don't want them coming away from it thinking this was a sad movie. We yeah. want this to be so fun. Like, on the, like the TV sitcom idea, something like the Big Bang Theory, where you know every 20 seconds it's got to be some little laugh line that oh. goes. It's kind of almost taking those consoles. Yeah, this so is yeah, stuff all these jokes have the contours of, of jokes, but without actually being all that funny. When they, yeah, and they miss funny. that comic books have always been able to work in very serious things. I mean, without there being a laugh line after. I mean, when Superman dies, I know it's DC, but when Superman dies in uh, against Doomsday, like, it is not a joke. Like, there's not jokes going through that that book. I mean, you're... You're there. It's got the, you know, like his his cape is the flag. He's dead on the cover. Um, and then as you read through the book, you're like, damn, like Superman's actually dead. What does this mean? There's not like uh, there's not some Daily Planet, you know, joke line that comes after that. It's just it's just a he serious gets, moment. And you're let to sit in it. He gets yeah. speared. He's on the floor, blood everywhere. And then Wonder Woman says, well, that happened. Yeah. <laughs> Well, finally, he's the one Patented getting humor. speared. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hell no. This is not happening to me today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's... This is getting highlighted by, like, auto made line legendary directors as well. Not just us on a podcast sitting at our uh, respective homes. That's what gets really funny about this. Because I saw it thanks to you, Drigger, but... Grace Randolph making fun of Francis Ford Coppola's movie. Oh but, like, my god, like, production yeah. Production issues. Like, what the hell? And she said something like, maybe it's not so easy to make those Marvel movies after all. It's like, what the fuck? You're, <laughs> you're talking to a guy who made Apocalypse Now, who made the <laughs> Godfather trilogy. Does he think he gives a fuck about Marvel films? <laughs> like, that was such a bizarre Good thing to Lord. read. And I saw, I was like, she's going to be punished for this. <laughs> like, everyone all over the internet will disagree with this. I mean, I think she's quite notorious for bad takes, but man, that is next level. Like, to, to insult a legendary di uh, director like that, that is something else. Um, and yeah, like, yeah. these guys, like, they have they have struggled through things that would destroy, like, anyone in the current crop of Marvel directors. You know, like, if any of them were tasked with making something like Apocalypse Now with the, the filming conditions and the problems that Coppola had to deal with, uh, they would they would lose their minds like they would quit after like a week. Uh, Dude, they that whole get generation their like, own movies. Uh, We've been over this like yeah. the directors in Marvel right now don't even get to make their own movies. Oftentimes they're like they're told their scenes are done already. They're just there to turn up and be yeah. like, "Hello, I directed this, I guess." Yeah, <laughs> that well, whole generation they... they had to go through a baptism of fire with their films. Like um, Spielberg when he made Jaws, that was a nightmare uh, yeah. for him to make, and with. Um, Coppola making The Godfather, like the studio wanted to pull the plug. They hated it. They didn't know what it was. It was an absolute nightmare for him. And then George Lucas making Star Wars, he almost had a mental breakdown, like trying to put yeah. that thing together. And everyone on set thought that they were just making a load of rubbish. So they all had to go through that baptism of fire. 
Yeah, can you imagine trying to create something so, like, wildly unique as Star Wars mm. in the 70s? Like, with the, like, no, I'm, it's, it's like, uh, it's like cowboys and Indians in space, but Buddhist. <laughs> with spaceships that like yeah. do stuff instead of just like being there on a string mm. and like they fly around they shoot stuff and then there's lasers and laser swords i don't i don't know it's pretty cool I'm like what the hell are you talking about no one how are we even gonna why would anyone watch this stupid thing dude i could imagine yeah, when like, they first saw darth vader they were like what is that <laughs> like <laughs> why is this man wearing a toaster on his chest it looks like <laughs> a bucket on his head oh you painted it black that'll fix it <laughs> 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 Turns out to be one of those famous villains of all time. You're like, oh, <laughs> well, okay. I, I think particularly when you watch the, the like Darth Vader without James Earl Jones's voice, yeah. like when it's yeah. David Prowse's actual voice, and like, oh god, <laughs> like, <laughs> that must have yeah, been but... a rough time on set. Nick, Nick, if you gave that as your actual literal elevator pitch, and you're an exec in an actual elevator, you just get off of the next floor. Like, get me away from this person. <laughs> I mean, you would, yeah. you would have and then to you just, call security. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you would have to kind of describe it as like, okay, so it's kind of like Lord of the Rings mixed with Star Trek, mixed with uh, a, a spaghetti western, um, mixed with fucking Seven Samurai or something like. <laughs> Listen, that's, just that's... trust me, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know but all those things that you like. It's everything that you like. We're just gonna put it in one package. Oh, and the guy has a sword that's light beam. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Nights, it, it, in space, also cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for for every movie like that that worked and like audiences embraced it and loved it, there's undoubtedly like a thousand other films that failed spectacularly, you know, and and tried to like do something equally daring and different and just didn't work. And so there's an element of luck in there, but also like great artistic vision and like having the right people involved in it and all of those things just came together well to make it. But yeah, now it's like, well, you don't have the kind of constraints that they were working with back then. It's like you don't have to use um, matte backdrops for, for your space scenes. You don't have to use, like, uh, miniatures on, on, you know, pedestals and stuff and moving them about by hand to get the, the space combat scenes done. Um, you know, you don't have the, this weird rotoscoping effect for your lightsabers. All that stuff, you can just do it all with CGI, like, easily now. There's, there's not that same kind of constraint, but then it doesn't really inspire the same creativity as well. And so what you end up with is just like pretty looking forgettable garbage with movies now. Yeah, there's not many movies lately that I've remembered. Um, I, I can think of I, two. I, Top Gun and Bullet Train. Yeah. Uh, that's that's it, though. I can't remember Avatar 2. I, I've, well, like, you... I'm starting to forget it already, like what I even saw oh, in that film. You went and watched it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's your I know it had, it had blue people and bluish green people, and there was lots of water and like a whale thing that. Listen, like, I know sad. there was a second act. I just don't remember it anymore. There was a second yeah. act. It was long. <laughs> um, I fell asleep during Avatar 1. I wasn't going to watch Avatar 2. Did you watch I... everything ever all at once? No. Ah, we should get him to watch nope. that. No personal yeah. animus against it. I just, uh, I, I'm skeptical of everything, and so I don't spend much time unless I get some uh, some good input on it. So that's why I watched I, Bullet Train. I heard it was really good. Watched it. Really enjoyed it. I mean, I think if you enjoyed Bullet Train, you would enjoy this. Not that I'm comparing them and saying that they're the same movie or anything, but like there's a lot of creativity and a lot of like mm. heart and thought that went into um, everything, everywhere, all at once. And I think yeah, you'd probably have a, a good good time with it. I'll check it out. Um, but yeah, Bullet Train was good. It, so, it kind of surprised me. It was um, just just a lot of fun. And again, just like it seemed like a, a movie from the nineties or something. And it was just trying to just trying to have a bit of fun with its concept, you know? Right. And I mean, then like these um, these these deeply shallow characters uh, is how I can best describe them. Is like the and it, it it's like a Guy Ritchie movie where like so much of yeah. the character is built bit. into yeah. how they look, how they're presented, what their name is. And then you get these little snippets of backstory that um, that just round them out like enough for the movie to work and be fun. And they, like they really did that with the twins uh, in Bullet Train really well. But it yeah. also it reminds me of what they did with like Snake Plissken in Escape from New York. Like if you didn't read the comics, uh, there are these little references throughout the movies to the comics. But like they were done well enough that you never had to read them to get like interesting tidbits about the character. 
and and that's when they do that and they make characters uh engageable like that it it just works like make character driven stories and and that's what uh getting back to the marvel shit that's what you have is a bunch of potentially character driven stories and they just can't bring themselves to make the characters interesting even though they've been interesting for 60 years yeah they're homogenized that that was definitely the thing that jumped out at me about um bullet train where it's like it felt it felt like a Guy Ritchie movie in so many ways. And, mm -hmm. you know, it it was helped by a really good cast. Like, all the actors did a great job. I think Aaron Taylor Johnson was, like, the fucking standout of the movie uh, as as Tangerine. Like, it was just... It was great. It was great. It was just really like, commanded every scene that he was in. I can kind of see why people are, are touting him as potentially the next Bond. Uh, he's got that kind of look about him. He's got the swagger. He's got the confidence. Um and yeah, like I, I thought he was great in this. Like it's uh, characters like that. I think when you marry really good dialogue with a really good actor, you know, you get great stuff. And like Marvel just wouldn't take that risk. They wouldn't be able to do characters edgy like he is. I don't know if they've got. I don't know if they've got the right actors for him either. Maybe, I, maybe somebody. I don't know. I, I think with yeah, I think with a lot of the Marvel movies now. Um, you're getting to that point where it's like you've exhausted most of the big name actors and so you're just casting anyone who's like young <laughs> and hopeful and just wants to be in a Marvel movie and it's like, you know, look at the Eternals. You know, apart from like Selma Hayek not. and a couple of other people like, you know, Angelina Jolie, like the bulk of them, it's like people that I've never fucking heard of, don't care about, just forgettable, bland, you know, vanilla actors. People you recognize go, like, here and there from, oh, that's that person from that show, and that's that person from that show. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, the, they're, they're fucking McDonald's actors, where it's just like you eat the fucking Big Mac, and then you move on with your day, and you don't even think about it for a second longer than you're eating it. And it's like, that that's the kind of actors that I they know, are. I never even saw it. <laughs> I didn't watch it even either. The, even the color scheme looks kind of desaturated and washed out. Almost as if, like, well, it that just was the, um, it's off. just bland. It's a bland movie. Like, there's no real focus to it. It's a whole bunch of actors and characters. Like, that the, the script doesn't know who it wants to focus on. It's just, bleh. What do you rubbish. mean? That was the director movie. That was the one made by a proper director. I remember Chloe them saying, Zou, yeah. yeah. But, like, have you seen Nomad Land? Like, the thing that she was famous for? No. It's, it's really. <laughs> Depressing? It's a movie about it's a movie about a woman who drives around in a van and just talks to people. Like it, wow. it's this kind of film that you or me or anyone on this panel could shoot like to the same quality. I think like there's no <laughs> real there's no real artistry to that. Um, and so like to put someone like that who did like a, a movie that was probably on a budget of like a hundred grand, if that, uh, to give her a two hundred million dollar effects heavy superhero extravaganza and expect her to be able to manage it it was just insane um like from the people i've talked to she was in like deep trouble right off the bat like didn't know what she was doing other people had to basically make the movie for her and it's not her fault it's just like she was completely ill-equipped to do something like this but that that's all they wanted they wanted to bring in an oscar-winning director mm. to do this film and so they could say that they'd employed her that's all it was is Marvel past the point where they can't really do a conventional narrative or character-driven stuff because people just expect they want something additional with meta elements or multiverses and stuff like that, that they can't go back to that other stuff now because they people expect that larger dynamics to be going on. It does feel that way a little bit. After Endgame, it's like you get No Way Home, which is super... I mean, it's probably not far from Home Game first, but I guess I'm just wanting to talk about the grander scales. No Way Home tore apart the universe. Multiverse of Madness tore apart the universe. Universes, should we say. There is a pretty big difference between those two things. Um, yeah, then, of course, Ant-Man and the uh, Quantum Mania isn't, isn't the stakes here that he's going to destroy all the universes again. Oh, probably. And, like, like cool. you know. And yeah, not just the universes, but, like, all of time as well. And, uh, yeah. who cares? So the and stakes become they... so gigantic that it becomes almost banal in a way. Yeah. I, I think it's, like, scope creep, isn't it? And that, yeah, but that's uh, that's the problem with doing. Um, so they're they're. We always talked about a couple different genres uh, or types of of. Uh, in, when I was a writing major, I guess we always talk about different types of uh, genre of writing. You basically have character driven plots uh, or character driven stories. You have plot driven stories, 
And then you have universe driven stories, which we never talked about in college, but I, I became familiar with as I got into like 40 K and then watching the star or like reading through uh, star Wars extended universe and Dune, like you develop this thing. And that's, what's going on with Marvel is everything has to be catastrophic within the universe on like the grand scale. There always has to be stakes. And it's amazing because even though, you know, like 40 K has had critical universe issues the entire time, they still manage to sometimes tell really good stories on really small scales and it works and it works within MCU also, uh, or with Marvel fans, I should say, because we, we see stuff like, uh, well, like we were talking about the Netflix series is they're popular, they're successful and the stakes for, um, the Punisher are literally just his own, his own revenge plot and dealing and grappling with his own loss. And like that deeply personal character driven story works just fine and they don't need a multiverse for the audience to understand it. In fact, we all probably understand it a little bit better than having to be shrunk down to the quantum level to go find our next adventure is, yep. is the idea of loss and dealing with it. And yeah. if they would just get back to doing that, you'll sell those stories all day. The characters are interesting and compelling and they have been forever. If you get a competent actor and you take any risk on a script, you're gonna you're gonna do it. You you don't need to end the world every single day. Daredevil showed us this. Punisher showed us this. Luke Cage showed us this. Uh, and and these movies are or these shows are just fine. They could do it with movies too. They just have no. They don't have any stones to write a movie. Uh, they wanna they wanna make a, a spectacle. The funny thing is the uh, the multiverse stuff <laughs> we've done up to this point. I'm pretty sure is all just superfluous. Sorry, right? because like Kang is in this. He's gonna be set up in this going forward. It'll be. Uh... I assume Loki season yeah. two will be the next reference, and then we're going to be running into the Avengers films where Kang is the bad guy. So well, we arguably, Kang, Kang Dynasty as well, haven't you? The TV yeah, show, yeah, yeah, that too. So uh, arguably, this like the Ant Man movie, this is going to be more important than any to the multiverse storyline that we're getting, uh, which makes you look back and be like, so what was the fucking point of the Doctor Strange and Spider Man ones? It's like they just used the multiverse to get more shit to show you more shit. I, I think um, that was like uh, like almost like an aborted attempt to introduce the multiverse, but it's like they half-heartedly did it, and then we're like, nah, it's too difficult, it's just, too big concept, we like leave that for now. I can see it just being like, a, we're doing multiverse in this era of Marvel, if you guys want to go ahead, and it's like Spider-Man, you know, I guess they were like, well, we can grab up Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, people fucking love them, and we'll just have them in and write them properly, and then people like it, and it's like, yeah, that can work out, and it, you know, it did, but... All of us are madness. What was that? Like, we'll go to a universe that is the same as the current one, but there's gro there's more plants everywhere. <laughs> what else are you gonna do? It's like, well, there's a paint universe. We go in for about a second. You're like, okay, we'll have Reed Richards. You're like, oh, you have Reed Richards. We'll kill him. Okay. <laughs> Wait, so there was a paint Just... universe, like like a Monet painting. It was no, just like it's, paint it's kind of like everyone's made of paint. So like if you, I don't know, if you jumped into a, if you jumped against a wall, you were just gonna splat everywhere, like because you're made of paint. Like oh, they steal that from Skyrim when you go into that painting for the one quest. It just it, it makes me it, it just like raises questions for me where I'm like, okay, paint is. I'm I'm pretty sure it's a man-made substance. So like, <laughs> how how did paint dinosaurs exist? How did paint fucking like? Ice Age people exist. Like, I'll how, how did any it. of that it's, happen? I would uh, go as far as saying I would have preferred seeing more of that shit. Actually, like, just running through all crazy ideas instead. Like, the craziest they went was... I remember the behind the scenes. They were like, we have, like, three different New York cities that we've got to try and portray this film for the majority. It's like, why was that your idea? <laughs> like, New York City, <laughs> but now is grass everywhere. New York City, but the buildings are falling apart. You're like, okay... Well, it was like New York City, but everything's free apparently. Like, uh, why? <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. She said it was that it wasn't. She's a dumbass. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, she's kind of like, oh well, most other universes I go to, everything's just free. You can just go to a hot dog vendor well, and take what you want. Considering she apparently discovers that by just stealing shit, I'm starting to wonder just how many of them were actually free. <laughs> 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 like, she's like, well, I didn't get in trouble for stealing. She's like... this, no. Running away like well, the cops are chasing her, like it's free, okay, just leave me alone. <laughs> well, I love the the subtle. They they always have to do the subtle dig at capitalism, right? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Your yeah. stupid universe, you have to pay for everything. Everywhere else is great and free. It's okay. We get it's it. Like, it's dumb in, as in fuck. these in these other universes, like hot dog vendors just spend all day grilling hot dogs because yeah, they fucking love doing it. Like they just love giving it away for free. <laughs> like, oh, really? So do they? <laughs> it's yeah. like 
Yeah, people do things because they get paid for them. That's the whole underpinning of like what human nature. Like, you don't just do things for the love of like. But this is what I said in my money. videos. Like, yeah, we haven't cracked infinite resources, so there you go. Lesson learned, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> like, this is. I don't, I don't know why this is hard for America Chavez. How old is she in that movie? Like sixteen. Someone needs to uh, tell her about economics. I guess I don't know. She still runs like a toddler. Like she's not. She's not learned how to run properly. <laughs> She's got a hero run. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just really obvious. Like I'm, I'm running on the spot, pretending to like run because there's a green screen behind me. You know, like, she's from the yeah. Edra Miller School of How to Run as a Superhero. Oh yeah, oh, I think there's only one student in that school. <laughs> like I don't think I've ever seen anyone run like that other than him. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like Robert Patrick from Terminator Two if he was drunk and high and retarded all at the same time. <laughs> drunk and high and retarded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, very squishy <laughs> there, there was something else i was going to bring up as well it's uh i don't know like is it's probably best if i just show you it um so hold on a second um for for all the people watching us there there's a new show coming out and oh, no. uh, for people for people who are older like you will remember scooby-doo and the, the the mystery van and stuff and like all that, all that good stuff from when we were kids. Oh. Um, but Velma now has got her own show, and <laughs> everyone uh, starts well, sighing immediately. Like, no. I, I just, I wanted to show you a screen grab from it. I suppose, like, <laughs> oh god, this is what it's gonna look like. Uh, this is yeah. what Velma is now. So, uh, just in the the little box here, you've got like how <laughs> Velma and Daphne used to look, and mm -hmm. this is what they have become. Yeah. And it's written by Mindy Kaling, who. If you probably remember her as the the most annoying character in the office, um, and someone who did the Mindy Project, which was about as funny as She Hulk, I would say. Um, oh. I should probably. It's weird because uh, you know I, I think maybe this is going to be an ordinary week, or maybe I'm going to have to like struggle to think a little bit about what I can make a video about, and then clang, here comes the thing that I can do. It's like like being in the blitz in london like there's a day of calm and then there goes the air raid siren and yeah you know, to deal with what's worth <laughs> mentioning yeah. by the way the the whole scooby gang is in this show except scooby-doo yep yeah well that's not shaggy the, that is, well, black guy that is, is not shaggy but Dude, i love how they they made him a stoner loser just like shaggy from the original wearing but a green they're, shirt they're but yeah but they wanted to like smash stereotypes by making him a black man it's like do you not do you not see the optics of this? Like, come on. <laughs> That's the this funniest can't thing. Be good. Does he help them break into houses and steal stuff too? That'd be helpful. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why are you doing this? <laughs> because what they've done is they've gone all the way around in a circle where they've turned him into the kind of black side comedy character that you used to have that was dated now that they used to have in the 80s or 90s. Yes. Like Damon Wayans would play that character. Yeah. And his his lines would be like uh, like I was saying before like this is not going to happen to me today or or oh, I'll say no. what or damn would be that character yeah so they've actually in, tried to empower the character by making it diverse but they've taken it back twenty or thirty years to that old trope and stereotype so dumb so essentially like from what I gathered from this trailer like Velma is now a black lesbian and yes. yeah Shaggy <laughs> is now a black stoner uh, and Daphne really... is vaguely Asian with red hair. Yeah. Asian, that thing, yeah, and there's kind of an implication of a romance there, and I'm just like, oh god, why That's does it have to though. be this? Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to just like ruin everything? Like the Scooby Doo show from when we were kids was just <clears throat> a bunch of goofy arseholes who went around in a van and solved mysteries. It was tongue in cheek. It was cheesy. It was fun. It was that was all it was. We didn't waste time on like like wondering about the character's sexuality we didn't worry about like the patriarchy or oppression or any of this other absolute garbage that like everything that we make now has to be laden with uh and it was better for it it was just fun this looks horrific and it's not even funny like based on that trailer it was about the same level of funniness as she hulk probably less so I was, you know what my I, first uh, my first association was was Star Trek Lower Decks, the same kind of uh, animated same style. Thing with, yeah, yeah, like same, same bullshit. Yeah, same, yeah, same sort of self-deprecating, um, snarky characters. Fred, by the way, now is a complete uh, narcissist. 
So of course he is, yeah. And I bet he's dumb as fuck as well. Because yeah. of course well, he we, has to be. We did see him like uh, knock over a brick wall onto himself and Velma, and which mm. should have killed them. And that would probably be better if they just died <laughs> right then and Isn't... the show was over forever. His like first line in the trailer is he can't see people who aren't hot or something, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was funny though. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, it's, it's absolutely to, true as well. But really? <laughs> I, don't, I don't see people who aren't hot. <laughs> <laughs> it just tells you, like, oh, that's what they're going to be making Fred. That's going to be as far as it goes. It yep. reminds me of this uh, dude I went to high school with. His name was Thor. And he's huge. And uh, this hot chick walked up to him. And he just turned and walked away from her. Like, she was talking. And just, he fucked off. He didn't say anything. And I was like, dude, what was that all about? And he goes, eh, she has fat girl potential. <laughs> is she is she like a grenade you know yeah. someone's just waiting to pull the pin <laughs> yeah it's like damn that's what uh, that's what fred reminded me of in the trailer i was like oh shit <laughs> fat girl potential velma Ooh. but the thing is like you could probably have fun with that but it's like they won't play it that way mm. they'll play him as just like a complete idiot that you're meant to like make fun of Right, you're, gonna, you're, you're supposed to hate him instead of thinking this is endearing yeah exactly <laughs> And he was ahead I, I of just, his time in the original series. Ahead of his time with that metrosexual scarf that he would rock. Remember that? Well, that was the seventies, man. I mean, that, that was just uh, anything went back then, didn't it? <laughs> Hell yeah! But now I just I wonder, like, who who on earth is this pitched at? Because I <laughs> genuinely yeah. don't understand. Can I just say though? The memes are, to me are just funny because oftentimes we'll say like, "Oh, new vision of thing is coming out." Oh, I guess that thing will be a black lesbian. That's like the yeah, joke. <laughs> yeah, and it's like literally <laughs> is <laughs> like they have actually realized the meme. Like Velma, is, <laughs> yeah. Velma is a black lesbian now. <laughs> like what? The thing is, if the four of us had sat around for an hour and facetiously tried to come up with a modern interpretation of what this would be, this would be the thing we would come up with. It's so strange. Apparently it's a cravat, not a scarf. Ah. So, <laughs> you yeah. get it. more of a red, even more of a red flag. I think. Yeah. Don't worry, Velma doesn't know that either. If it's not flannel, she's not familiar. Yeah, but you know what I mean? If we were just joking around and saying, well, obviously let's make her black, and uh, obviously she's super empowered and she speaks in a snarky, kind of pert kind of way, and then obviously she's got to be in a lesbian romance with the girl, let's make her uh, Asian, and then uh, Shaggy, let's make him black. Like everything we would do to be facetious is actually what's come up in reality without irony yeah. well yeah, they make it's... it harder and harder to parody it you're like oh we gotta go yeah. further she'll be uh, disabled and alien or something yeah yeah <laughs> it's like she'll get she'll be quadriplegic by the end of the first season i guess think, but like do you think replacement shaggy is gonna have like a black hood best friend that he calls dog named scooby like <laughs> like is that how they're gonna play that like it's Maybe. not gonna be an actual dog it'll be like his metaphorical dog well, I'm personally outraged that there's no Latino representation in the show. So um, they need to have they need to step back from the conversation and reflect on why they I, didn't I, do that. I mean, I've got to be honest. I'm I'm furious that there's no like drunk Scottish representation. Yeah, we're it. the Welsh people. We're the long people. Yeah, it's like oh. if we can't see people who look, talk, and act exactly like us, that we can't identify with them. That's the <laughs> that rule nowadays. So yeah. Well, the funny yeah. thing is, I can't identify with any of the characters they just presented to me. So I mean, that I guess that's partly true, but it has nothing to do with their looks or ethnicities. <laughs> it's all just the shit writing. <laughs> I mean, is this going to be pitched at like people of our age who remember the original Scooby Doo? It's like, no. hey, it's a trip down memory lane, but everything's shit now. <laughs> like, that, know, that's, that's the selling point. Like the 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 like, he it looks pretty violent, right? Like the yeah. that chick with no yeah. brain, like her head is laying open, dripping blood. Yeah. Daphne's naked in the background. I mean, she's got suds on her tits, but uh, mm. it's like, what what age group is this? I was watching the trailer with my with my wife and uh, and her friend. We're sitting there um, and I'm looking at my stupid phone. But watching this thing, I'm like, oh, I have to watch this for the show I'm going on. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're like, Trinker made me do it. We're, they're just asking, they're like, what, what is this for? Like, who is this? I, I don't know who it's for. Like, I can't figure that out. It's on HBO. I don't know what that even means anymore. But it's mm. it's like not my, a... My timeline or cause and effect, I think, is there was there's an army now of um, girls who were not the most pretty or beautiful in high school quite intelligent, um, they weren't quite socially cool, and now this they've grown up to become this mass army of screenwriters who are now creating yes. these characters who are very evocative of that time, who are kind of snarky, clever, 
um, not the pretty one. And you see this character's sort of recurring. It's kind of a wine mamish kind of thing now, blended with that. It's kind of tongue in cheek, kind of self deprecating, but also trying to be empowering at the same time and a weird kind of muddle. And I, I don't know who it's pitched at. Is it supposed to be for like 15 year old girls to feel like sassy and empowered when they watch it? Is that, is that the deal? No, I think Fire I, I at think... Will's got it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like, it's, like... It, I think it's literally just for the people who wrote this. It's like they're projecting yeah. all their hang ups onto it. And, and, and I kid you not, man, it's the same fucking story as She Hulk, where it's like, I'm uh, I'm mid thirties. Like I live alone with my cats. I'm depressed. Like all I have is my job. I've got nothing in my life that's got any kind of uh, like long term worth. Well, the or, office was for peak, right? For her. Yeah, and it's like, uh, but I need to like. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a character that's exactly like me, but have her be amazing, and so that's going to make me feel better about myself. And that's like pretty much the mindset behind. Oh this. wait, this is for my, this is for wine moms. Uh, I should. It'll fly well in my locals chat then. Perfect. That's great. It'll be perfect for my locals chat. We'll all watch it. No. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I do have to ask. Like, was Mindy Kaling ever fucking funny? Because no, like she was annoying in the office, and that wasn't written by her. And then I saw a little bit of the Mindy project because I was kind of curious, and I was like, nope, that's awful. Like it's like about as funny as a cancer diagnosis. And now you've got this, and I'm like, how does she keep getting work? Like, who keeps hiring her and why? The funniest so, thing she ever did... Everyone's just like, no, she wasn't. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> the funniest thing in the office with her was when they were playing that... Um, they were playing that game where uh, they had to wear, like, an ethnicity on their forehead on a post-it note. That joke's note, amazing. And the other people had to, like, act it out. And she got Indian and Michael Scott was doing, like the most offensively Indian impression ever <laughs> and she just slaps him. But it wasn't funny for her. It was funny because of him doing the impression. It was just fucking yeah. great. Well, so I just checked. Apparently she wrote two episodes of The Office. So they're both in season one, which is the least popular season, right? Except for the last one. Yeah, because that's when they hadn't quite figured out the characters and Michael Scott was like a totally different person. Yeah, all that stuff. Unless this is something else. Oh, wait, The Office... Most of the office actors were the writing staff. Oh, my they... bad. I was reading the wrong thing. She wrote 26 episodes of The Office, apparently. What oh. the fuck? Really? And that Probably stretches from season one to eight. She had a, several. A contributing okay. writer or the a sole writer on those credits? Um, some of these come across as though she was the sole writer, potentially. I'd have to check in more in depth. But yeah, I'm not familiar with her work that much. Well, I, I, I watched all of The Office, but I don't know which ones were her or how much she is the reason for them being strong or whatever. But she's also got like full weddings and a funeral. I didn't see that. The sex lives of college girls. Oh, God. That sounds like it could be a good movie, but it's not. You, you know right. how that, that, that sort of stereotype <laughs> that like female comedians can only ever do like about like a routine about sex and relationships? Well, yeah. <laughs> like... well here's that. So here's the, the issue. Fuck, where was I going with this? Um, Ah, damn it, I lost it. Never mind. I'll it <laughs> Sorry, that happens to me all <laughs> the time. It doesn't matter. The only way I think where they could make it uh, more for modern audiences than it already is is if they had an ancillary character who uh, is neurodivergent and is kind of judged for it, but actually turns out to be the one who solves the crime because they think yep. in different ways yep. that other people don't. It's the only further well, I, 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 Well, they're, they're missing a trans character. Uh, that's, that's true. That's, yeah. that's... They'll, they'll have one. They'll have one, I'm sure. Oh, I, I thought of it though. Does it, it does it ever occur to these people that not every smart female character was actually a snarky, sarcastic asshole? Like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> if there's a like, and, and the the one that did it right was Daria. Someone mentioned Daria back in the in yeah. the movies or whatever. Daria yeah. was great, but like, ever since Daria, it's like any smart female is particularly young character has to be mm -hmm. like sassy and sarcastic it's like that yeah. no not all smart chicks were sassy and sarcastic some of them are just smart and uh, mm -hmm. and and like not uh they didn't have to be specially interesting they and velma was not like as snarky i mean she she would have occasional stuff but she was just the smart nerdy chick and that was fine yeah she I would think, lose yeah, her that glasses. was it like that was one That's of the right. main things that happened. She would drop her glasses. Yeah. 
but it's like they, they each had kind of a role like or a niche within the group and yeah like her thing was like she kind of knew about scientific stuff and like she was just like yeah like you say the nerdy one who could um puzzle things out in a more intellectual way but she wasn't right. perfect and yeah like i don't know why you would feel the need to make her the focal point of a narrative like she's not that interesting as a character uh, and it's kind of the terrifying that IG, I, I, if That's ign if yeah. IGN gave this show six out of ten, it's literally a two out of ten in real person <laughs> yeah. terms because that's so the show yeah. was pitched as a love quadrangle. Uh so they're all so uh, Shaggy <laughs> Shaggy has got a crush on Velma. Oh. Velma's got a crush on Daphne. Daphne has a complicated relationship, it says, with uh with Velma. And Velma's got a crush on Fred, so it's a it's a quadrangle. Of, you see what I mean? Uh, about, Fred like, has a crush why... on Shaggy. Yeah, no one's got a crush on. But, but who's got a, who's got a crush on Scooby? That's what I want to know. That'd be Daphne. Naughty, Naughty Fairy does. But it's like, why? Why does any of this stuff have to come into it? Like, why does? Why do we care about like the sexuality and the like? Whatever each of these characters are attracted to, like, why is that important to a show like this? It's they, just uh, they lost like, the idea that all of that was just. It was all subtext. It was, like everyone was kind of in on the jokes of it in the original. Like you knew Fred and Daphne were together, like hmm. that was a thing in the original it was one. Implied. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's implied. And then you you get the idea that Velma's like always kind of like interested in Fred a little bit just because he's the handsome, charismatic leader type. Like he's the alpha in the room, even though he wore an ascot or whatever. But um, they didn't have to say anything about it. It, it wasn't the main focal point of the show it didn't matter it was just ancillary to everything and that again mm. like that can be fine like you don't we doesn't mean we all want a show about uh about velma's love interests actually i don't know that anybody asked for this anywhere on earth i i tell you what man like i don't know if you saw any of this stuff when they did this weird masters of the universe reboot i personally as a kid never wanted to watch skeletor fucking evil lynn but I got to see that in the, in this new show, and it's a thing I can never unsee, and it's horrifying. That's what I mean, though. That's where they take shows like this, like where it just it's things that you just never needed to see or know about, but suddenly it's right at the forefront of the narrative, and oh god, it's it's awful. It just makes I mean, you that, question your reality. That's why everyone's thinking when they watch it. It's like, who's the skeleton guy? Fuck. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and if he's if he's given head, how does he do it? Because he doesn't technically have a head; he's just got a skull. Like, it's, oh, no, literally a skull. Does he have, if yeah. he doesn't have balls, because he's just a skeleton, can he actually can he actually ejaculate? We need to know these answers. Well, Evil he's got Lynn, a body. It just like it stops at his neck, and then it's just a skull from that point onwards. So, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. I always how thought it was he... a suit that he just wore that gave him muscles. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, but then how does he talk if he doesn't have a tongue? Like, how does he see things when he doesn't have eyes? Like, that's, yeah. that's just, we'll answer questions. that later. The sex questions come first. That's yeah, I think so. <laughs> but if you're gonna do Hanna Barbera cartoons, like, well, let's do let's do the Flintstones. If we were to do uh, the what they've done to this, if we did it to the Flintstones, how would we change the characters? Bonnie's well, Wilma so... would be the head of the household. Fred would be an incompetent moron, obviously. Bonnie's she gay. would also be gay. Yeah, with Barney. <laughs> yeah, Barney yep. would be black, and yes, he'd definitely be black. What was his wife called again? Barney's um, wife, Betty, right? Was it Betty? Yeah, I think it was it Betty. Yeah, she she would be like a transgender lesbian or something. Like, yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, they, like that, all that stuff would be worked into it, and it wouldn't be subtle. It would just be like at the forefront of every episode. So that's probably <laughs> how I would adapt it for modern audiences. This is mostly off topic, but you brought up the Flintstones. And I couldn't unsee it. Someone posted an old like Flintstones Christmas thing where they had a Christmas tree and they're standing there. <laughs> it's like, bro, what are they celebrating? <laughs> because it all would have happened. BC. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of this. But Something which is uh, really wild is you can see the, the in the originals they used to. It was like back in the fifties or sixties they would have like smoking commercials put in there so fred yep. lights up a cigarette and says <laughs> hey, it's a really good great taste with this marble cigarette oh so, god that was a different era it really was 
I miss it. I miss it a lot. I miss I. I just missed like the the honesty of of entertainment that was there. <laughs> like we don't have to pretend that no that everybody wasn't smoking at that period of time. Like cuz everybody was. And uh and now we just have to pretend that smoking doesn't exist. Like you, it's so hard to find a cigarette scene in a movie these days. Um because I think it gets an automatic R rating or something. It's crazy. Well, I think they struck the the right balance in like the eighties and nineties when like some people would light up, but like you'd always have a character going, "Yeah, you know those things will kill you." Yeah, and yeah. everyone would have a good yeah, laugh I know, and then go into the next scene. <laughs> yeah, and it's like okay, you've got your public announcement in there, and we can move on with the scene. When you get good in the, the main character, Joker. they're like pulling a bullet out of him at the time when he's lighting up. Like those things will kill you. He's like, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, That's the scene I needed. If you have like fantasy and sci-fi, if a vampire is smoking, and it's like that thing will kill you. Just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> let it try. <laughs> uh, I was gonna also say, um, you know, we live in an era, gentlemen, of streaming. Streaming services are everywhere. We've got Netflix, we've got Disney Plus, we've got Paramount Plus. Apparently, that's a thing which exists. Uh, and God knows what else. We've got Amazon Prime, um, but it's not doing very well. And apparently, Disney Plus, more than anything, uh, last year they lost one point five billion dollars on their streaming service. Um, that is insane. <laughs> That is is just terrifying, and I I just have to wonder like what is the long term plan there? Like you can't keep losing billions of dollars per year on your service and expect to keep it running. Like what are you doing? What is the end goal here? Is it's I is it I don't just to know, become like man. the the dominant streaming service? In which case you can buy up everything and then jack your prices up three hundred percent or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea what the, the long-term idea of this is. But, yeah, maybe it's a loss leader. They see it as a loss leader. They're going to make uh, Disney Plus the go-to streaming service for families or something like that. But they just don't seem to pull any any of this uh, – pull off what they're, what they're after. Like, who wants – uh, when I sit down to watch TV, and they've got a brand problem because I never think I'm going to turn on Disney Plus – like if I'm like, I'll go, OK, let's see what's on Netflix or let's see what's on Amazon Prime. I'll do those two things. But I never it occurs to me to go, what's on Disney Plus? I'll go if I want to watch a Disney movie like with the kids or whatever. I wonder if this is on Disney Plus. That's a different thing. But I never sit down and go, this is my go to streaming service. I, sorry, I, I had to say as well, like that one point five billion dollars that they lost was just one quarter <laughs> in, 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 in 2022. Uh, that's terrifying. Um, what's your projected annual losses? The GDP of a decent-sized country? <laughs> yes! Just, to me, it feels like w this was all set in motion ages ago, but it was that same, like, they gambled everything on streaming during COVID years, and it's like, guys, this is the best it will ever get, the COVID yeah. years. Like, you, you understand that, right? And then they're all just like, la, 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 dollars are coming in. It's like, what are you doing? It's going yeah, it's like eventually brain. People are eventually going to start going outside and going back to movie theaters and stuff. Yeah. Like, no, 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 this is how it will always be now. I think maybe they assumed that uh, there would be a huge amount of streaming services and then in a Darwinian kind of way, they would whittle down and whittle down until they had a sustainable three or four, but it hasn't worked that way. You've still got a large number of streaming services with too many small slices of a large pie everyone vying for, for eyeballs. Well, I think the, the problem is that like streaming services are only a part of any studio. Like, you know, with Disney, it's like you've got your movies, you've got your theme parks, and then you've got your streaming. And so, like, you can force, you can essentially, like, continue to subsidize one by having the others be profitable. But, like, that can only go on for so long. Eventually, you're going to have to either cut your losses or, like, dominate the entire industry. And I think that's what they're hoping, just to try and outlast everyone else. And it, it, to some extent, it kind of explains why there's this, just, this crazy push to just keep producing more content. It doesn't matter if it's good. It doesn't matter if it makes sense, whatever just more stuff to put on the streaming service to try and entice people in in the hopes that like you'll eventually become the dominant one just by making more stuff than everyone else and yeah, lasting you could say longer all of the the shows are all symptoms of this there's why we try and talk about this every once in a while like the whole what the hell is going on with the industry right now 
Um, is like gaming the only one that's just sitting there moving along? Like, hey, here we are making billions. How you doing? <laughs> They're making well, you, so you've only, much money. You've only got one. You've only got one kind of outlet for gaming. It's like it has to go onto like PCs or games consoles. It's like you can't you can't have that as a streaming service or whatever. It's like it just has to well, be mobile. That, so. But yeah, mobile. I mean the the Google Store and the Apple Store. The amount of money uh, that are being pulled in by Google and Apple off of that stuff is it's unreal. I mean when. Well, when Fortnite was down, or when Fortnite uh, had their alternative store for like three days or something, I think it was like $220 million that Apple missed out on because some of the purchases went through the alternative rather than the Apple store. Like, And that's just Apple's commission on that. The amount of money that is happening in the mobile gaming industry is it's unreal um, how much people are spending. And uh, and yeah, it's like you watch these movies with hundred million dollar productions or whatever, and it's like, well, they made eight hundred million dollars. Like, yeah, but some guy coded a Star Trek game, and it made eight hundred million dollars, and he spent forty thousand dollars coding it. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's not even comparable. The the margin on them is it's great. I it cracks me up honestly. Well, I think we're we're in this spot now where like the 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 AAA games have like the same production value as movies like you're watching them and it's like yeah it feels like i'm watching a movie when you get to those cutscenes, uh and that's you know it's, it's a sign of like how far the medium has come like in terms of like narrative like artistry and stuff like how how good it is how great it looks on screen um but also like how much money like ends up getting invested in these games like yeah you're gonna get the occasional um like hit that's just like some guy who just coded it in his office like on on a weekend or whatever but like the most of these games like have got the same budgets as as top tier movies the triple a ones do but like where yeah. the where the money like where the money is coming in is it's in this mobile market because that's where they're really hitting um, you know, the East, that's where they're hitting India and China, the massive cell phone markets over there. And, and the microtransaction market is huge. Oh, yeah. And I mean, uh, you, I love that you mentioned the, the like hit that someone coded or whatever, because my favorite game to, that I've bought in the past probably year or two is uh, Vampire Survivors, which cost $3. And like <laughs> some guy made it. And then all of a sudden, there were like a bunch of news stories about it and stuff. And I'm like, this game's just fun. Like, you could just play it for 30 minutes at a time. It's a blast to play. And, uh, and some guy, it's his own like labor of love that he made. And it's like a, an homage to Castlevania characters in this weird bullet hell. And it's, it's a fun game. Well, dude. And he's rich uh, now. Good job, dude. On that yeah. point, you know, we played on EFAB Gothic Phone a whole bunch of times. It's a free browser game, it's like one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. It's like it, 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 gaming is a weird beast, honestly. It's hard to because you know there's still companies that are dying in gaming, but there's others that like you know God of War Ragnarok has uh, beaten the records for all the other God of Wars in the franchise for how much money it's made. It's just like so that franchise is healthier than it's ever been. Um, yeah, and it's, it's so started in 2005. But they obviously had to invest a huge amount of money in it to make oh, yeah. it. You know, because like hiring really good. Well, it's voice absolutely talent insane and stuff. now the production as you were kind of highlight and you know these cutscenes they get made with like people acting out the scenes in mocap suits and all those different like uh technological setups and then hours and hours and hours with millions of people working day out day out to get all of this shit ready for and that's not even that's not even coding the game <laughs> it's not even mechanics yeah but so what what's G grand theft auto 5 made now because i remember when it crossed a billion a long time ago yeah, and we talk about like these these movies, and uh, yeah, I mean, Grand Theft Auto Five costs a lot to make, but it didn't cost anything more than a major Hollywood production, and probably less than some of them, and it's out earned them by catastrophic amounts. Um, I and I was, I I was on a charitable board a couple years ago, and um, the uh, the investment firm had brought into uh, to a, one of our board meetings. They had brought in this uh, guy, and his his job was to explain emerging market investments to the charitable board. And I was the youngest person on it, and um, I'm sitting there as he explained that the uh, what was it? This I think the Starcraft or the League of Legends like World Championships was how much bigger it was than the Super Bowl, like how much bigger the viewership was, and like all these uh, all these older people are sitting there with like 
huh? Like people watch video games. I'm like, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> like the live attendance, I think, was bigger than the Super Bowl. And the viewership that was happening online was bigger than the Super Bowl. And they're like, what? And the guy's like, yeah, emerging markets, is specifically in the East, gaming is destroying everything for entertainment. It's, it's not even close. GTA 5's made six billion as of August 2022. Remember, the highest grossing film of all time is Avatar 1, and it's at two billion. I know, but th this would be the equivalent of like re-releasing re Avatar into the cinemas every about two years or so. Like, yep. that's how GTA 5 works. It's like, well, next generation of consoles, cool. We've got GTA GTA 5 remastered, remastered, ultra mega HD edition. You know, that's, that's how they keep doing it. Like, they have oh. milked that cow as much as you can milk it. So, just out of curiosity, if you knew this, you know, the Xbox 360 era, that whole era for, for Xbox, uh, yeah. not including bundled games like Connect. Uh, what do you think sold the best on, on that era? It's like, oh, it's GTA 5. It's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so what about the Xbox One, Xbox One <laughs> X, Xbox One X, all of that era? It's like, this is GTA 5. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't got the result yet for the next year, but it's so fucking funny. It's probably going to be GTA 5. <laughs> I mean, when 6 comes out, like, my God, people are going to go insane. When 6 comes out, people are going to buy 5 again. Because they're going to buy 6, and they're going to go, God, this is shit. Let's buy the remastered 5 again and play yeah. that instead. I think even Rockstar knew when they were, they made 5, they're like, this is it, guys. We've done it. <laughs> we've, we've, we've peaked. Crack gaming. Yeah. We've, we've made the perfect game. <laughs> It is pretty then, fucking fun, though. <laughs> it's great, and it's like Red Dead Redemption 2 is fantastic as well. Like, love it. Um, they just, they know what they're doing when it comes to these big open world games, you know? Um, Gaming is a totally uh, foreign world to me. I'm, I'm like Gary. I, I just, like, struggle to open a door. Uh, I get stuck <laughs> easily on levels. I, I genuinely, I, I want to have a show where it's just Gary trying to do normal things in games. <laughs> 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 Call it Gary Games Journalist. <laughs> yeah, like when that games journalist couldn't do the jump dash and Cuphead in the tutorial. Oh my god, god that was the best uh... video. <laughs> this is too hard. I can't play this. I can't do it. Because <laughs> I, I was saying this tomorrow, like uh, you know, like I'm playing through Ragnarok at the moment. He's like, oh, how come you're not streaming more of it? And it's like, well, when you're when you're playing it normally, it's like you can just soak it up and take your time and like just enjoy it as you go. But like when you're streaming it, you kind of feel like you have to be in entertainment mode the whole time and like passing comment on everything and like really progressing quickly through it because you don't want people to get bored if you're just like mooching around the same area for ages. Um, and it, it kind of it doesn't ruin the experience, but it, it makes it different for you, I suppose. And like, yeah, it is a can... different experience, yeah. Yeah, and it's like you can't you can't really enjoy it just as an, a member of the audience. Almost like you feel like you have to be presenting it to people. So it's it's one of those weird ones. Um, yeah, I just think it, like if you were playing something like Elden Ring and streaming it, like what pressure on you? Because damn, like you're gonna get killed a lot. Like if it comes oh. to the boss battles, like and they just sit there and mock you and ridicule you. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it's like, like oh, uh, you loser. There, I beat there this might in be times. Try. Yeah, there might, <laughs> it might take you a whole evening to get through one boss, and it's like, well, there's nothing I can do except retry it, and it's like, dude, if uh, I it, it got a war as games as well. If I came across something I couldn't beat, like with my current outfit, the chat would be like, oh no, he's gonna be here for literal hours, and I'd be like, yep, settle in, everyone. <laughs> I ain't going until I beat this guy. And they're always like, well, you should do this. And you're like, no, no, I'm gonna play it my own stubborn, stupid way. Leave me alone. Like my exactly. no bigger build on Elden Ring. You, you always get that one guy as well who's like, God damn, this is painful to watch. And it's like, oh, sorry, I got killed twice. That oh, you only, get you only got one of those? That's my entire chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, like in terms of like Disney Plus and uh, and the whole streaming model, um, I guess it points, particularly in their case, to like a, a real financial hole that they've dug for themselves. Like their their whole model has been to just buy up everything and get involved in everything uh, for the past several years, and now they've kind of run out of money to keep doing this stuff. Like now the bills are starting to rack up and. Yeah. It seems like they don't really have an answer to it. Like they, their solution at the moment has been to fire their current CEO, 
bring back the guy who engineered a lot of these problems in the first place and just hope that he can somehow magic up a solution and yeah do you see gary's video on all that oh, it's yeah like... he released one a, a, a day or two ago it was pretty yeah. comprehensive it's sort about of... all the stats and everything yeah summarizing all of this it's insane and it really is like he's the fall guy like they gave him a sinking ship and then took it back off him to say he sunk it so now they can start working on trying to fix it while blaming him for everything Just yep damn ruthless man <laughs> I mean, that's, I guess, how these things are done. But yeah, it's it's kind of an awful way to run a company. And yeah, man, it's like when, when it comes to a, a world now where we're into streaming services, where we're into like next generation content and uh, like all these different like online arenas for like how people are, are taking in content. Um, I wouldn't really trust a 70 odd year old man to to be the one overseeing that stuff. It kind of feels like he his generation of of executives aren't really going to understand the potential of this stuff and how best to run it. And yeah, I just I, I can't see it working with with a guy He's like that. He's got a very Bob very sort of traditional mindset of, of mergers and acquisitions, which doesn't really reflect all the dynamics you know that are in play. <clears throat> But I think it's it's you can only gobble up so many movie studios before you run out of cash to keep doing it. And again, you have to make use of all the the things that you've bought. And when I look at something like I don't know Twentieth Century Fox that they bought over, what have they really done with that? Like they've inherited the back catalog, which they could put onto Disney Plus. But again, is that really going to add you lots money. of subscribers? Not yeah, really. That's the Pixar seems to have lost a lot of its magic and oh, appeal yeah. as well. Pix Pixar well turning, like... turning Red was great. What are you talking about? <laughs> Lightyear, fantastic movie. Like, massive success. Uh, the... you've, got, you've got Lucasfilm, who, like, they haven't put out a Star Wars movie in, like, three years. And, like, their TV shows That's... aren't going to generate jack shit in terms of revenue. You've got That's Marvel, something... which seems to be faltering. So the Gary problem that said they're that they... doing... Oh, go ahead. Turned, a, uh, turned one of the greatest, most profitable film franchises ever into a streaming franchise yeah. that is mm -hmm. failing. Like, you know, we, we've, we've talked about how Andor is praiseworthy, but, like, nobody cared. That was, that's yep. the newest iteration of Star Wars. Nobody cared. It's like, fucking well, hell, what did you do? <laughs> like, what have uh, you done? As Sir Boyd of Lard says, they, they got Avatar with Fox. That is true, yes. Uh, but that's one movie. And, yeah, it's, it's definitely a heavy hitter, but it's only one film. It's well, and that not was going to change the equation overall. And that was in like the last month. We were talking, you know, like the whole, the whole. Like, when did they buy Fox? How long ago? Well, that's like two or three years ago, easily. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, when the, <laughs> they need to speed it up. The one of the issues that they've got is they they buy these franchises like Star Wars or Marvel or whatever, forgetting that I mean, yeah. You could stream new stuff, but everybody still owns their physical copies of these things that they liked. And so if you're buying up old IP to just put on a streaming service, you're not adding new people. Like, because the people who actually care about those things, all of that stuff comes from a generation of existing high quality physical media. So unless you're doing something really new that people are going to like with the IP, dumping it into a streaming service is a complete waste of money. Like, I, I just can't imagine uh, someone who really wants to experience Star Wars going like, I'm going to sign up for Disney Plus for this rather than just pulling out their Blu-ray of the remastered Star Wars or whatever, you know, like that. Yeah. And so then if the new stuff that they're making with the IP isn't going to sell, uh, which they, because they're not making the old stuff just new, they're making new stuff that no one wants to see. And, uh, of course, it's, it's just going to be a money pit for everything that they buy. It's like, maybe they should stop trying to buy up old IPs and to, to revitalize a streaming service and just make something new for people to tune into the service for. No, it's, Nick, it's... you don't understand, man. <laughs> like, making new stuff requires creativity and taking a risk. And That's we, true. We, we don't want to do that anymore. What we want is safe, reliable incomes from things that people... <laughs> <laughs> already know and understand so we can just milk existing properties that's all it is it's so oh, yeah. predictable like the the complete lack of creativity that goes into these things is terrifying the, right nick, nick mentioned that like it can be a bit of redundance because we already have the physical copies if you don't have the physical copies you should get them just yeah. saying all your favorites of all time and that includes games tv books whatever just everything 
get them physical, folks. <laughs> we, we might because be one of the last generations that can. Anything that came out in the 80s or 90s, like it already comes with content warnings saying like this contains outdated mm -hmm. themes that people uh, might yeah. find offensive and all that. And it's like, okay, that's you're one step away from starting to cut things out and, oh, and edit things. So when when Mel was visiting me, I wanted to show him certain episodes of Community. And the one I wanted to show him, Chad, I don't know where I'm going with this, is the Dungeons and Dragons one where one of the characters cosplays as a dark elf and he just puts a black face on it's hilarious <laughs> but there's a black character who's just like what the fuck are you doing he's just like i'm a dark elf like leave me alone <laughs> it's funny no. as hell it's self-aware they got rid of it on netflix it's gone you can't get to it and i was like fuck i don't actually i can't show him that episode just uh you know from netflix it's, it's, it's awkward but it's just like it's so fucking annoying that i can't i can't watch the media i enjoy because someone else was like no it's too mean yeah. So, um, my wife was watching, she, she watches through all of Star Trek chronologically in the background while she does stuff. She just has it on. And, uh, she was just on the last original series movie, uh, the, the, what is it? The Undiscovered Country or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they're, they had like the most banging racist joke against Klingons that happened. Uh, the Klingons it, like is, teleported is it, out. Is it the guest who's coming to dinner thing? No, it was, uh, it was the, so the Klingons, like, they get on the teleport or transporter and they go away and there's two ensigns walking and one of them's like, oh God, can you imagine, like, can you even stand the smell? And then the one's like, man, the, the top end, only the top end models are even able to speak. It was like, holy shit. Like they just dropped this spicy race joke in, into the movie. And I was like, you can't even do that anymore because now like Klingons obviously represent black people. So now you're making a terrible racist joke when it was actually racist against Klingons, but it was, it was perfect. It's like, Oh God, that's what we need more of. We need to go back to just having racist jokes in movies well, and it'd be okay. Well, I, I think is, is this the same, you know, is this the same line of thinking where people nowadays are like, Oh, the orcs from Lord of the Rings represented uh. black people. And it's like, nobody <laughs> thought that back in the day. It was like, you're just projecting your own fucking weird perverted like view of people onto this, this property. You know, I like the the Klingons always represented communism. Like they always represented the Soviet Union in Star Trek, and so like when um, when Undiscovered Country came along, it was just a direct parallel to like the, the collapse of the USSR and like the the mm -hmm. uh, Perestroika yeah, exactly. and stuff that was going. Literally on came out in nineteen ninety one, I think that film. So it did, yeah. So and, like yeah. that's that's what I always took it as, but it's like again, people project their own hang-ups onto these movies in retrospect, yeah. and it's such a weird thing to witness, because then they get re they, they also get retroactively offended by things that weren't even in it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's such yep. a weird yeah, yeah. thing. I, I, uh, Jenny, I love I've, the I've whole... Got a, uh, sorry, sorry, I've got a, uh, okay, a go commitment that I, I cannot get out of, so I'm going to have to uh, to leave you guys, but it's uh, been an absolute blast, and uh, thanks for having me on once again to talk about the right state of Hollywood. And it's been lovely to hang out, but I, I absolutely have to go. No, no problem, man. Thank you for coming on. And nice uh, for you, people, for people yeah, in too. chat, uh, please subscribe to Echo Chamberlain. Uh, he does. Pro he produces some amazing, like, great breakdowns of like movies, like how characters are portrayed nowadays, and just like the general state of modern entertainment. Uh, it's very good stuff. Um, and he even had one from Tatiana, <laughs> which was fantastic. <laughs> I had. I, so, I was looking for uh, text-to-speech AI software, and I found some with an accent. So my first thought was, what is the single stupidest thing I can use this for? And uh, that's what happened. I, I never get over the critical doggo style line. <laughs> 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 that was great, man. Yeah. All right, anyway, so thanks so much, guys. It's been a blast, and I'll see you guys later. Yeah, see you, dude. Thank you. Peace All right, bye-bye. Catch you later. Hmm. Do you uh, think we three can keep a conversation going? I don't know. Uh, I know. We're, we're all pretty shy and retiring. <laughs> I don't think we can handle this. I uh, saw uh, someone in chat brought this up, and I, I can't help but do it as well every time. It's that when you knock out the ability to get those on streaming services and you don't actually have them on physical copy yet, uh, there's one place left. It's called is. piracy. <laughs> like, and, Yar! And, but Sailing the thing the is, seas. there's no argument against it at that point. You can't say that's unethical. You'd be like, well, I can't get it anywhere else, <laughs> even if I pay. So, you know, at that point, you do pay for it. It's just refilling that deleted episode from the service, isn't it?
the, it's it, it's such a, an insidious and unsavory idea this idea that like your favorite shows and stuff are on streaming services and they'll just decide arbitrarily like well this particular episode is offensive to people now so we're just gonna we're just gonna quietly like erase it from existence so like it mm -hmm. never happened uh and you can't buy it on blu-ray or, or anything like that either because again same reasons we've decided like it's not acceptable for modern audiences and it's like who the fuck are you to decide yeah. <laughs> retroactively that this thing that people loved that was made like 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, is now unacceptable? Who are you to decide that no one's entitled to watch that thing? It's, it's so... It's clearly fucking, pressure. Like, like, it's not actually any kind of consistent rule that they went through all of movie and TV and they went, you know what, this is now unacceptable by modern uh, understandings of morality. It's just when enough people complain about a thing, it almost makes you want to test it out. And get a whole huge group of thousands together and just they all complain like i saw a toilet in back to the future i think that scene should be deleted it's offensive yeah. shouldn't just have a toilet there and just see how many times you can complain about that before they go okay we're gonna remove the toilet we agree it is offensive there shouldn't be a toilet it's just like because uh, that's all it is right it's just buckling it's like please keep I, using I our services yeah uh, yeah it's uh well i just it, the the backwards projection is is the main thing. I mean, sure, there's there are some things that were uh, racially insensitive or culturally insensitive in the past. And one, we have to just go. Who fucking cares? Like you can't you can't undo the racism of 1953. Like you're just not gonna go back. Like you don't have a time machine. You're not gonna go back and fix everything. So just accept that it was part of it. But then there's that projection, the race projection that that happens, like with the the black people being orcs. The first time I read that, I was like, "Wait, orcs are black people? How?" And they're like, "Well, yeah. they're <laughs> they're depicted as savages and all this stuff. Like, this is You're not like, helping Whoa. you. And it's like <laughs> it's not good. The, the the people who claim to be on the side of like righteousness and like <laughs> diversity and stuff are the ones projecting this stuff onto everyone else. It's like we literally never saw it as that, but like you guys are the ones telling us that that's what it is and that's why it's unacceptable. It right. says a lot more about you than it does about us." These orcs are not eating chitlins. What are you talking about? That's what, um, <laughs> do you remember that extra credits video where they were like, they, they did the same thing about orcs and stuff and, and everyone was just like, stop. You, you, you're saying horrible things. You think you're saying nice things. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and it keeps happening more and more. It's really fucking annoying. Every time. Because you can time. laugh at it, but then if it actually has like significant power and actually makes it so that we can't watch things anymore, it's just like, Jesus Christ, why? Well, they're already talking about like uh, Ace Ventura, like because of all the the Einhorn as a man like stuff in it, and it's like that, which is a great payoff, and it's really funny in the context of the movie. But like again, people apparently are really offended by it now, and it's just like, do, is there anything that you guys can find funny now? Like people no. like this. Is there anything that's acceptable to laugh at for these people? Is there any joy in their lives? I don't think there is. I think it's just like they, they exist to be miserable and like make everyone as miserable as they are. They do. And and the, the crazy thing about that is so it's couched as jokes in Ace Ventura and like everybody's in on the joke and it's all ridiculous. But it's also like kind of the normative experience. Like if you if you were making out with someone who's dressed up convincingly as a woman, you find out they're a man, like the average guy is going to be a little bit unsettled by that, but you're not allowed to be unsettled by that anymore. That's the problem. Yeah. Like you're there. You're supposed to see a, a, a trans woman or whatever, which I don't think that's what was actually going on there, but you're, you're supposed to see that as no, that's just a woman. It's like, well, except for the, there's three reasons it's not the, the worst case of hemorrhoids <laughs> you've ever seen. And it's, like, I just think is like is 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 like his over the top reactions where he's got like the fucking toilet plunger in his own mouth and he's like, oh, <laughs> he's like burning all his clothes and like in the shower crying and stuff. It's just great. It's so funny because it's so overdone. Um, but like, yeah, like that kind of humor, like it's just it's not allowed now. And I just think. God damn, like, what are, uh, yeah, what are future generations going to look back on in this time period and think, yeah, they, they really nailed comedy back in the 2020s? And Great then, stuff, a classic, yeah. 
and I, I know it's such a generic like trope joke or whatever, but but honestly, like the 1984 ing is is really strong with these ones. Like homogenize everything into an acceptable uh, lexicon. Everything has to be here. If the joke deviates from acceptability, it needs to be cast off, excised, and put into the dumpster of history. First, it gets a content warning. Then it just gets quietly removed from a streaming service. And so you're asking, like, what what is it going to look like? Like, what is the next generation's comedy? It's it's going to literally be Velma. It's just that over and over in every medium. It's She-Hulk. It's Velma. It's the new Masters of the Universe. It's going to be the same things where there's there's this uh, little Venn diagram of acceptable comedy, and it's just a circle that says our shit and nothing else. And I, I think <clears throat> the the Onion did it quite recently, and it was like it was a response to. Um, like the the voice actor for Apu having been cancelled from The Simpsons because yeah. like he wasn't actually ethnically Indian and mm. like they just did this thing and it's like <laughs> we we now present to you humor family and they're all like there's the the gray Wojak face and it's like <laughs> now acceptable for all 557 genders and like all the all the different like you know tropes of of uh, diversity and stuff and it's like designed specifically not to offend anyone and it's just like the most bland awful like gray sludge humor you can imagine but that that's what we'll end up with you know it's like the things i find the 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 almost content warning things they they piss me off quite a bit right didn't they do one for aliens where they were like oh that the, that was awful yeah it's yeah, like contains it's, outdated attitudes it's like what like the, the, fuck the out women are actually like, quite capable of doing stuff and like kind of awesome was it all just uh, is that, that was an outdated just attitude? Is it Bill Paxton's lines? Like, is <laughs> was that the outdated attitudes? Is it just Bill Paxton? It's part of the <laughs> character, and it's great. He has a full-on arc. Why are we? Like, it's like damaging the actual stories. And then I say that as if the next step, as you put it, is isn't getting rid of it altogether. Which is just like, to be honest, that should have been way too unacceptable. That's like a line cross. It's insane. You just yeah. stole content from the world. Why? Because it's like, well. We don't think that you should see this. He's like, fuck yeah. you. What the hell? Yeah, it's like, who, the who fuck are you is to we? <laughs> who are you? Yeah, who are you to judge what we should see? And you might think like, yeah, but okay, it's only going to be the super extreme stuff. It's like, no, nope, it, it, it's a random episode of a comedy show. The like, is Faulty Towers still allowed on streaming services? I don't even. Oh, know. it's got to be. It's got to be right on the brink. This is the thing. Like, I I hate to be that guy who's like, oh well, it's the slippery slope argument, but that's exactly what it fucking is. And it, that's what it always starts as. It's like, the, the, you'll start with this tiny little thing. It's like, we just want to edit this little really offensive phrase out of this one show. Then we just want to take this scene out. Then we just want to take this episode out. Then we just want to take the entire show out. And where does it stop? It doesn't. It's never enough. All of these things have to ultimately go. They all have to be erased. They all have to be replaced with like safe, dull, predictable politically acceptable garbage and, they literally, them. and under the ideology they have to because if you refuse to remove the thing that offends the next person then you have marginalized and outgrouped that person's concerns in a way that was unacceptable for every other group and you can't create the new outgroup you can't create the new marginalized class because that makes you that makes you the empowered bigot so you have to bow to the mob every single time once you really get down the road a little bit. Um, and everybody thinks it's going to be, oh, just this one thing. It's like, well, it's just this one thing, then the next one, then the next one. And then it has to be everything. And yep. then you, you'll you never be able to tell the difference between someone being actually offended and it being a troll move. Well, none of us know how often this is even happening. Right. Oh, like cause they did it to Splash and Back to the Future, and obviously, like I just mentioned, Community. I'm pretty sure that Faulty Towers episode with the Germans is in trouble, at least. I I, I think uh, what was it? Um, Gone with the Wind's in trouble as well. When, when it comes oh, to the sure. portrayal of black people and slavery and stuff like that, like that. But like they do it as you right mentioned on the edge. quietly, and these ones get picked up because there are still people fucking watching these things, and they'll be like, "Wait, where the hell did this go?" And then they'll tell everyone, like. Because that's how that'll work. I'm surprised the Monty Python movies are still on Netflix. Because I watched them recently and I was like, how are these still here? <laughs> like, it won't give, be long. Give it, give it 10 years more or they'll be fucking gone. They have, but, to yeah, wait, like... they have to wait for them to die. 
because they're still popular enough to have a voice, even though uh, and they're they're trying to use like John Cleese and uh, to be to be a little bit woke here and there. But he also will push back from time to time. So he's kind of like this fence rider. They have to wait for John Cleese to die because those guys are universally pretty much likable and they have the ability to call that shit out. And if it happened to them, uh, they would be, you know, they'd be up in arms about it, but they'll wait once they're dead. Then they'll, then they'll censor Monty Python and there won't be anyone to defend it. That, that has the same voice that John Cleese or Eric Idle would. Yep. Yeah. As this guy says here, uh, this is why you gatekeep. And yes, if you, if you're in part of a, a hobby, a subculture, you know any kind of like interest group or anything like that gatekeep the shit out of whatever it is that you do and if people come in and start saying oh if you could just change this little thing to make it a bit more inclusive you tell them to fuck right off because that will never stop they will always ask for another thing and another thing and another thing until whatever it is that you're interested in you don't even recognize it anymore because they have changed it so much and it still won't be enough for them. It's almost like the nicest way you can put what they're doing when they remove TV show episodes is gatekeeping. Like There are much worse words for it that I'd rather choose, but it's like, what are you doing when you just tell me how everything works and how I'm allowed to consume uh, my favorite shows? People, Yeah, they need people to stand in the way of these things and say, no, fuck off. We don't care if you're offended. We don't care if you don't like this thing. If you don't like it, nobody's forcing you to watch it. You're free to go and do a million other things. But for the people who actually still appreciate this stuff, it should be there as a matter of like historical relevance. It's there because that's how it was made. That's how the original artist intended it to be. And it's not for you or any other fucking idiot nowadays to come around and fuck with it. I'd like that to is give not you your job version. and it's not your right to do that. Well, we're gonna we're gonna need something um, to happen, maybe at the uh, legal level at some point. Um, call it the the abandoned property restoration and preservation act, because what's gonna what's gonna happen? What is happening is places like Disney, with unlimited money, will buy up a a catalog of content, and they'll know that there are certain things in there that they don't want the people to ever see again, right? So it just quietly gets shuffled off, but they own it, right? So how do you? How do you get to the things like, well, you can approach Disney and, and buy it from them and they will say no to no matter like if they're principled in their opposition to the thing, they'll just never sell it because they want to keep it away from away from the public forever. And so what we're going to have to do is have uh, somebody come in and say, OK, if you buy a property and you, you completely remove it from the market, there will be some sort of possibility to uh to acquire that property for someone for fair market value right so that people could crowdfund for that one thing and and purchase it out and if they don't like you know utilize the property every so often similar to how licensing agreements work with like marvel and and uh and uh what sony pictures like they had to put out a a, an x-men movie every so often or else they would lose it or they had to do a fantastic four movie there's gonna have to be something like that to preserve some of this stuff or else we're just going to lose it because well, how do you compete the, with disney well maybe the rule should be that like you you can take over this property and you've got the right to re-edit it however you want but you have to make the original version also available for a point of reference and there has yeah. to be an unspoiled copy out there as it was intended by the original artists because it's unfair otherwise you can't monopolize art in that way you can't just take it away from people because you don't like it anymore like but i mean the, i know like the, the you'll get things like the library of congress will select certain movies or tv shows or whatever to be preserved as a matter for like historical significance but it's like it has to be major stuff it has to be things that are like genuinely important um but there should be some backup of that like some whether it's a government agency or whatever who said like right well you can you can take the rights to this thing but we still have a a copy of the original work they have it for, for like old video games they have like the uh, the abandoned the abandonware archives where you can go and like download for free basically all these early 80s uh computer games and shit or play them in your browser even and it's great like it's this cool 
system. And it's like, you don't want to go play them every day because they are still early eighties games. And like, they're kind of, they're kind of simple. And so you can either beat, yeah, you can either beat them quickly or like that, you know, that these aren't 60 hour games. Uh, but it's nice to be able to just go, go play one of these old things that you played before and just take a quick trip down nostalgia lane. But a lot of these, uh, a lot of the properties were, you know, they're owned by somebody somewhere. Most people don't even know who because of the way the video game companies actually uh, developed. I remember when um, Doug Tenaple was trying to get the rights to Earthworm Jim, the, the, <clears throat> the video game rights, and try. So Earthworm Jim was owned by Interplay. And how, who the fuck is Interplay now? Like, Interplay hasn't existed in any real capacity in like 15 years. So how do you even track down who owns the remaining property from the Interplay studio out of the out of the employees who were there? Like and he was telling me about doing that and it was just an absolute nightmare trying to get to it. But it's uh somebody owns everything at some place and finding them now is is getting crazier and crazier. The more um, they do like take st stuff away or censor it or do fuck with it, uh, it will encourage more people to be like, "All right, we need a conscious big effort in in saving, you know, art basically." And like, there will be like a under the radar archive start being generated for movies and TV to save the originals. Because I mean, you know, how many versions of Star Wars are there? Like specifically of A New Hope, is there's a loads. lot, a lot, yeah. Because there's uh, ones with like Hayden Christensen as. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's in the fucking projections at the end. It's weird. It is weird because like Luke never saw you. OK, <laughs> he doesn't even know who that is. <laughs> you didn't have to do that. Like the no. original was fine. You could have just cleaned up the the transfer <laughs> from the yeah. from the original reel to the digital. That's OK. We didn't need you to change anything. That's what gets me about all this stuff. They, they always want to like change stuff. That's why. That's why I was so annoyed even by the Michael Bay Transformers movie. It's like what I wanted them to do was just remake the Transformers movie, but with like people in CGI. I thought that would be awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, they they made the new thing. And then when they like redid Final Fantasy VII, it's like, no, we're going to redo it as a completely different three game set. It's like, no, why didn't you just make the first one look good? Can you just do that? Just remaster it like and Diablo 2 should have showed everybody that that can be really successful because they just well, yeah, made you, Diablo 2 look better and everybody was happy about it. It's funny you say this. We, we're right around the corner from Resident Evil 4 and Dead Space getting their remakes. And uh, some pretty big changes have been made to Dead Space. At least, well, it depends on you, how you feel about him. But, like, Isaac is talking. He, would, he didn't talk at all in the first game. I don't think he did anyway. Um, but he's talking in this this remake. And, you know, a lot of people have already said, like, it seems like an upgrade, but... We'll see how it all goes. It's, yeah, it's so interesting because we, we've talked about what our era is, what our generation is exactly for, for art. But one of them is definitely just this hyper-reliance on what came before. Uh, there's yep. still original stuff, quote-unquote. Um, yeah, but so how many things now are just like reboots, remakes, reimaginings, reboots, remakes, sequels, like sequels? Yeah, yeah it's just like, yeah, it's like the no death risk. of creativity. Well, yeah, and I think that's a big part of it. It's just like we can play on what things people found appealing before we're just going to capitalize on that rather than take a risk on something new and different and wow it's just you excited for indiana see. jones 5 so excited <laughs> can't can't wait to see 500 year old harrison ford hobbling around sad, oh, <laughs> sad old man. when you just... make us see this to clarify to the studios who just listened to critical drinkers say that that does not mean that we want to see Harrison Ford's successor either. No. Indiana Jones can He's just done. die. It can it can be what it was, the first three movies, and nothing else ever happened. Nope. And those are great. And and you don't need to revisit, retool. They rode off redo. into the sunset. It was over. Yeah. <laughs> How much more do you need? I mean, <laughs> Do you think this is legit like Kathleen Kennedy's just like giant fuck you to everyone who hates her? <laughs> it's like, ha, you thought I was done? Well, I'm going to ruin another property from your you know, childhood, you dicks. You done can't it stop said, me because I own it. If she would said like, yeah, this Dial of Destiny's coming out. It's going to be written and directed by Ryan Johnson. We'd be like, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he would relish it as well. He would love it. Just getting to destroy another another giant franchise. Like, yeah. Subvert the shit out of it. Hell yeah. Uh, I've got a, I've got a few super chats that have come in here. Would you would you gentlemen have a little bit of time? We could do a few. Yeah. Yeah, I have uh I have forty nine more minutes, but I'll be right back. I gotta hit the bathroom. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, yeah, but I I would say this stream's gonna go on for another forty eight and a half more minutes, probably. So <laughs> yeah, that works out quite nicely. <laughs> All right. So the first one here is from Jade Light, who says, "Yo, drinker, I really liked your um." Horizon Forbidden West review. Your praise for it on Open Bar made me play Horizon Zero Dawn for the first time. I'm 40 hours in and I really like it. Excellent stuff. Good. Cool. I'm pleased by that. Um, yeah, there's one thing I, I wish I'd mentioned in my review for Forbidden West and I'm pissed off that it passed me by. Because um, one of the things I called out was that Aloy's kind of flat in terms of personality. She's a little bit like just all about the mission and stuff. There is a mechanic within the game that actually allows you to overcome this where it's like you get a choice for how you're going to respond to certain things. Like, are you going to respond empathetically or aggressively or, you know, intellectually to try and resolve certain situations? Um, but it's only done, like, a handful of times throughout the whole game. And it's like, it would have been a perfect mechanic to, like, tailor your experience of the game to suit your style. You know, you could have, like, had her, your whole character's personality gradually change over time. If you keep selecting, like, aggressive for everything, she becomes more, like you know, domineering with, with certain people or whatever, or, or people start to treat her a different way, but uh, it never really makes use of it, and it's a shame. It's a total missed opportunity right there. Um, but yeah, overall, I did enjoy it. Um, Ant Rodriguez says, Hail to the panel. Random question, but what's your favorite toppings to go on pizza? Pepperoni. Just that. Just nice and simple. Listen, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I like ham and mushroom and sometimes olives on a pizza uh, or sometimes I get kebab meat because that's like a guaranteed way to a heart attack hey. so right there um, yeah but that's fair enough classic uh, and Rodriguez also said I've been talking about Breaking Bad with my friend recently he says that season 5 is unnecessary with how season 4 ended I however disagree thoughts uh, more. Can you walk me through what happens in seasons four and five so I know what he's referring to? Of I Breaking Bad. Yeah. Well, the end of season four is he defeats Gus, if I remember correctly. Is it? You're and right. Okay. Just, and you know, it, there's just an, I don't understand how we could end it at season four, like because obviously we wonder what happens next with the overall. I think he's because it's season five, the the concluding one. Yeah, of course. So season five is he starts oh, okay. to vaguely build the thing back up. And then at the halfway point, Hank finds out, and then by the end, everything's falling apart. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of need resolution for Walter's character arc, which you're not going to get without season five. So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm very fond of a lot of season five, so I would not want to drop it. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, Taker610 says, I thought the prison escape in Andor was kind of hilarious. The thought uh, wasn't let's find a transport, but rather let's yeet ourselves off this ledge and hope that there's land nearby, I guess. <laughs> what? Uh, mm. That is true. Yeah, like they, I don't know, maybe they knew that it was kind of close to some kind of landmass, but yeah, they, they just kind of jumped off and hoped for the best. Andy when? Sarkis Which part now? I'm, I'm blanking on that. When they jump. Well, you know, when they escape from the prison and. Like, there isn't oh, really a way off the, the water. The, yeah, they just kind of jump and then swim. Well, I assume, I yeah, part of that, though, is just, like, we need to move. Like, because every second that goes by, there's more time for the Empire to send whoever to stop us, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the part that annoyed me about that was that it's like, he, he says, like, I can't swim. And it's like, well, all right, plan. If you can't swim, we can we can help you. And we can teach you how to doggy paddle or something basic, you know? And then it's just like, oh, whoops, I fell off. Bye. Like, yeah, yeah, Aww. totally. It's like two people can probably support you, and like, really, how hard is swimming? Like, you can probably float without too much difficulty. It's not I mean, that yeah, you hard. Should be, you're not going to drown if you've got people around you can help you out as well. You should be okay. Just don't panic, right? That would be what you tell them. Don't fucking flail around. Just try and stay calm. Yeah, yeah. It's like, um, it'd be okay. Uh, Nick, the, one of the questions as well is like, what's your favorite toppings on pizza? This is important stuff that we need to know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, so my favorite pizza right now is uh, Italian sausage, mushrooms, jalapenos. It's not uh, far off what I said. I said ham and mushroom. So. 
That, those aren't yeah. the same. <laughs> oh, look, I on. like ham and mushroom pizza too. I love mushrooms on pizza though. Like it's there's something about it. Like the texture's good and that dry baking that they do. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Where are my yeah. pepperonis so, around? I like cute. pepperoni. Good. I don't mind it, yeah. It's it's okay. Don't mind it. Gosh. I'll devour an all meat pizza, like, man. It, yeah, <laughs> like if you presented me with a pepperoni pizza or a ham and mushroom pizza, it's like either one would be fine. I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't complain about either one of those. If you put uh, if you put pineapple on it, then we'd have a problem. <laughs> it's not, I, was say, I don't want to ban yeah, anybody, but you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the pineapple on pizza. I, I don't like sweet with my dinner, uh, personally. Like, I don't like the sweet, spicy Asian shit. I just want spicy and salty. Like, that's what I want. But there's this um, there's this pizza place by my house called Thousand Degrees Pizza. And you can go in, and whenever I go in there, though, I like make a mountain of toppings on the pizza for them to cook. So it's, yeah. I say it's sausage, mushroom, and jalapeno, and that's what I'll order when I'm on the phone with the pizza place. But if I'm in one of those places where it's like, build your pizza like a subway, and then they throw it in the oven, that shit gets covered in everything. It's you like, end up with a I'm, cake, yeah. basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm usually just like, yeah, give me the meat feast or whatever your equivalent is. It's like all the meats. <laughs> That'd be fine. Uh, what was it someone was saying here? Um, damn, Philly cheesesteak on a pizza. That's, that's that'd be good. Now you're talking. Yeah, yeah that that, that mm, I can deal with that. I really want a pizza now. <laughs> what about like a, a pizza? Fuck this pizza. stream. I'm out here. I'm gonna get pizza. <laughs> Put pizza on each slice. Pizza is yeah. so low. It's so low on my like go to food list. Uh, I, I never actually want pizza. If it's around, I will eat it, right? If we're going to a pizza restaurant, I'll eat it and enjoy it. But if you ask me what I want, pizza never comes to mind for me. No, I can right. get that. Yeah. Uh, the next one is um, Grimnak, who says, From an unsuspecting land of pipe weave and mushrooms come the two bravest heroes to ever walk, Scotty and Pippin. Hail to the panel. Love you all and have a good one. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Um, a Chernobog says, "Thanks, Drinker, for showing me Mauler." See, so, yeah, oh. I, I, I showed him. <laughs> I showed you to him. Uh, thanks, Mauler, for reminding me how much I enjoy intelligent discussions on EFAP oh. fifty. The Ooh. rise, fall, rise, fall of Wolf is a sad tale. Also, tell Rags that I said hi. Will do. Will do. Okay. Uh, JS Pena says, "What is your favorite color?" Uh, I think it's red in my case. Quite Mine's like black, obviously. Big fan of blue, black, and red, but purple actually is probably my favorite color. There it is. Uh, also from this guy says, Drinker Mauler, I started Doctor Who with Christopher Eccleston two months ago. Do I stop after Matt Smith or do I give Peter Capaldi a chance? Oh, I suppose it depends on who you ask, right? Because uh, I think Gary and Az would say push through on Capaldi. Uh, for me, I gave up on Matt Smith. Uh, I lost yeah, interest I was... in the show. I think that was pretty much the same story for me. I think from what I've heard about Capaldi, it was like he was a, a really good actor, lumbered with terrible scripts. So I felt that way about Matt Smith's era. I didn't like the scripts at all with his. Uh... Yeah. And to be fair, I felt like the Russell T. Davis era was still hit and miss. There was episodes I thought were cringe as fuck, um, but there were also ones I thought were great. So it's really up to you. Just go for as long as you're enjoying it, right? Like don't hmm. don't keep yourself going when you're not enjoying it. I think so. Yeah. Um, Joseph Heisen says, Big fan, love your work and respect you shielding us from modern junk. Also, how do you collab with critics like Az and less known creators like uh, Lance from uh, OC and Dark Hour from LTC? Great fight scene analysis, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's, I guess that's the advantage of doing open bar. Like, we've got the opportunity to bring in all kinds of different creators at different sort of stages of their careers. Um, and it's nice. Particularly when we can bring in people that are just starting out and give them a little bit of a helping hand, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's what we what we get to do sometimes. Uh, he also says, "I would say that my dream panel would be you, Mauler, Disparu, Nerdrotic, and one or two relatively unknowns who can add expertise." Thanks again for all you do. Cheers, and have a few on me. Thank you. And uh, yeah, well, That'd I hope be a good you panel. I hope you made do with the panel that we had tonight. You know, <laughs> I think we had some pretty fucking good people yeah. on. But to be fair, the panel they just described, I'm sitting here like, have we done that panel? We probably we have. probably have, yeah. <laughs> we must, well, we've had Disparu on a bunch of times, and we've had Gary on a bunch of times, so yeah. we must have done that. Um, well, and I've been with I, Disparu on FNT, you probably have as well, so... 
Yeah. This the search the names. You may just discover a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there's you. Yeah. There's usually a crossover. Um, I Dog says, "Do you plan to watch Ryan Johnson's new show, Poker Face?" Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> What is that show it. supposed to be about? I have heard the premise is a girl who can always detect whether someone's lying is making her way across, I think, America, and she keeps bumping into crimes happening and can't help but solve them. Isn't that just that one show that, uh, what's his face, Tim Roth was in? Oh, Didn't would start. I lie to you? Or lie yeah, to lie me? to me. Yeah, lie to yeah. me. Isn't that just that show, but with a woman? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't want to watch more things from Ryan Johnson anymore. <laughs> like he's really bad at writing. I, like I'll, because the Glass Onion shit, man. I didn't really want to watch it. It was just like it's the kind of thing, though. Everyone wants to know what you think of a thing. You're like, all right, fine. I only fucking watched it because you made me do it. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> and you didn't even want to do it, dude. Nobody wants to watch it. Like. <laughs> Uh, RRTNZ says, uh, Hail Drinker and Guess, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a review or stream on Dodgeball, a film that combines slapstick, parody, and more great throwaway lines than a two tons of irony Hallmark card. That is true. Dodgeball is fantastic. Dodgeball. <laughs> uh, yeah, Rip Torn in that movie is fantastic, man. Just throwing <laughs> oh, wrenches yeah. at people. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, and they, they had like the good physical comedy in there. With Justin Long, who is very funny in the movie. He's just beating uh, up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. getting hit by wrenches and shit. And then Vince Vaughn. I mean, that dude. When he's in his, like, Vince Vaughn-isms, I really like it. I love that uh, movie Neighborhood Watch. I don't know if you guys saw that. The Ben Stiller movie. Um, where they find, like, the alien laser beam. Did you guys see that I haven't at all? seen it, but I've, I've seen the trailer, I think. It's Ben Stiller, Vince Vaughn, Jonah Hill, uh, some black guy. Um, whose name I don't remember. And, uh, like, it's like a, they did the neighborhood watch. It got pulled from theaters because right when it was about to come out, the Trayvon Martin shit happened. And, uh, and that was like the big, the big thing was that, uh, uh, Zimmerman who shot Trayvon Martin was a member of the neighborhood watch. And so they were like, oh, we can't put this in theaters. It was offensive. So it like flew below the radar, but it's a really fucking funny movie. And Vince Vaughn and Jonah Hill just like vibing off each other is, is, that's like exactly what I want to see in a comedy. It was so good. Did you see Vince Vaughn in um, Curb Your Enthusiasm? No, I I've never in. watched it. Uh, really okay, he's, he's pretty good in that. I must admit, like, because uh, I think a lot of the time he can come across as a little bit lazy. You know, he's kind of like later day Adam Sandler in a lot of his movies, where it's just like, yeah, you, know, you just feel like you're playing Vince Vaughn. But like, yeah, in that, I think he was pretty good. Um, next one is. Uh, Coop's Girl, who says, I got Dark Harvest for Christmas and I loved it. Read it in two days, just couldn't put it down. It's a fun take on the Dyatlov past incident. Kudos to you. Thank you, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, Chuxenhausen says, Okay, Drinker, I watched all of Tulsa King and it's great. I think Rocky, but instead he kept working for Gazo all these years. Even more, though this isn't his type of show, we'll love it a bunch. Cheers, gentlemen. You know, oh. I've heard good things about Tulsa King, so... Yeah, looking forward to watch it. I just want to finish Yellowstone first. Um, the Tickler says, Hail Drinker, when is the next Ask the Drinker stream? Uh, I've got a new job and can't check my phone nearly as often as I've got a question I want to ask, but so I don't want to miss it. I mean, you could have just asked it here since you've got a super chat on the go, but uh, yeah, Ask the Drinker streams, they kind of just come up as and when I've got an evening free. Uh, I don't put a huge amount of planning into them. They're just uh, whenever I'm available, but... Uh, yeah, it's been a, a week or two since I've done one, so yeah, I'll do one pretty soon, I would imagine. Um, Zach Winters says, uh, Hey, Drinker, have you seen the new Puss in Boots movie? It's far more fantastic than it should have been, and it's a great palate cleanser from bad movies. I mean, the, the trailer made it look okay. I, I don't really know what else to say about it. Antonio Banderas is always fun to listen to, I guess. I've um, been hearing a lot of good things about Puss in Boots 2, which is not something I expected to ever say. Yeah, <laughs> I have all the movies to be good. Like that's a weird one. Uh, yeah, maybe it's good. I don't know. Uh, Dearus, give me a thumbs up. So thanks. Uh, Krusty Juggler says, "Puss in Boots: The Last Wish might end up being the best movie of 2023. It'll be hard to beat. At least, damn, everyone's loving Puss in Boots." 
Well, now it's going on my watch list with the kids. Yeah, got to see that shit, man. Yeah. Um, well, tomorrow night I'm going to go see Megan. I have no idea if that's going to be good or bad, but uh, hey, well. call it by its true name, Mithrigan. Mithrigan, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You have to let me know what happens with that. I'm curious. Well, I mean, it's literally because my mate texted me the other day and says, like, I'm going to go see this on Friday night. You want to come? And it's like, oh, fuck it. Yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, I've been to the movies for a couple of weeks. So that'll do. Um, Mr. Lucas says, hey, guys, what's the dumbest thing in Star Wars for you? For me, it's Starkiller Base. Drinker would love to buy you a whiskey if you're ever in Sterling. Well, I could be if you've got whiskey on the go. Um, but yeah, dumbest thing ever. In Star Hyperspace Wars. Kamikaze. Fuck. What's up there? Dumbest thing ever. Are we discounting what they did to the characters? Uh, it could be anything, I suppose. It could be a device. It could be a person. It could be a character arc. Whatever you want it to be, really. I mean, mine's, what, mine's okay. is going to be the, the decloaking scan. Fuck. That <laughs> <laughs> My dumbest thing in Star Wars is the fucking Jedi Council not recognizing that bringing balance to the Force meant literally the rise of the Sith or the death of them. Like, that's the dumbest. Like, how are you people supposed to be smart? And you, you see balance in the Force. You know there's only one Sith Lord and one one Padawan or whatever, and there's like 500 Nick, of you assholes. Motherfuckers couldn't look up in the sequel trilogy, and you're picking that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, yeah. God, there's so many to pick from. Somehow Palpatine returned. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> Dark magic and cloning. Uh, I don't, yeah, it's impossible to pick the dumbest thing. There's so many good choices. Uh, RRTNZ says surely Airplane is another comedy classic worthy of your time drinker yes it is uh, is it worth uh, sorry it is worthy and I won't call you Shirley check the clearance Clarence uh, yeah Airplane is fantastic love it I love, it. Um, I love when, today. when they have the flight attendant giving the uh, the blowjob to the inflatable pilot <laughs> <laughs> he's just sitting there like with the coffee <laughs> they nailed it Oh, so, so many great bits. It's like whenever <laughs> all the passengers start freaking out and it's like a naked woman just runs across yeah. the screen for no reason. Or when they assume crash positions and they're all like flying through the cabin for a minute. Yeah. Like, <laughs> 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 or it's just like, uh, yeah, when, she, when the flight attendant gets on the intercom and she's talking to the passengers, it's like, uh, so there's nothing to be alarmed about. Um, you know, we've experienced some turbulence, but everything's okay. By the way, if there's anyone who knows how to fly a plane, can you let us know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I picked a hell of a day to quit sniffing glue. I love that movie. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> uh, Angry Minky says, has anyone seen the Pink Floyd The Wall movie? Good question, oh. actually. I've never seen it. I watched it once, and I, I wasn't high enough Um it's that's a weird fucking movie. I watched it like 3 a.m. in my room in high school. I was sitting there and I turned it on and uh, I still don't know what fucking happened in that. I know he shaved his eyebrows off at one point. I think I've seen it, but not for ages. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, because that for me, that's 24 years ago, I think. That's a while. Um, <laughs> Dark Hour says. The masturbatory awards got low ratings. Well, color me surprised. I mean, yeah, that's that's pretty much all you get with, uh, with the Golden Globes and the Oscars. Um, Fortune and Glory says, Dear Drinker, I hear you're planning to attend more cons here in the States. I am indeed, yeah. I'm going to be in Atlanta at the end of February, so that'll be nice. Looking forward to that. What are you um, doing in Atlanta? Doing a con there. Um, oh, cool. There's Atlanta Comic Con. I'm going to be there. It's like the last weekend in February. So, yeah, I've got my mm. flights booked and everything. I'm going to be guesting there and I'm going to try and do a meetup with as many like fellow YouTubers as possible. So, reasons um, to go to Atlanta in Yeah. <laughs> Meet up, man. We'll do some drinking. It'll be great. That'd be fun. Uh, but yeah, he said, uh, any chance of a trip to Chicago? I know that it's a war zone, but we'd be honored to have you. Well, I mean, I've got a guy who's like arranging a bunch of different Comic-Con appearances, so I will do my best. Um, you ever seen this drinker? Duncan Taylor? Uh, I don't think so, no. Oh, I got it. It's, uh, it's a Berkeladdick 14-year. Berkeladdy? Uh, yeah, Berkeladdy. Well, I call it Berkeladdick because I'm American. Yeah. 
But yeah, a friend of mine got me this. I've been waiting to try it. I'm looking forward to it. But I uh, I got a bottle of Brook Laddie when I was 21, and uh, God, that stuff went down good. Um, but yeah, it's 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 weird. They've done a weird rebranding of their all, all their bottles and everything, so they're like turquoise blue or something now. It's weird. Yeah, it's we that's it's a strange look. It's a strange yeah. look. It, it cheapens what's actually a pretty good whiskey. Uh, mm-hmm. But you've got a nice a nice one there, like a nice gift set. So yeah. Ease T says, uh, is star power still a thing? Just for me, it has never influenced what films or TV shows that I would watch. It used never. to be a thing. It definitely used to be a thing for me in my like generation. It was like, new movie with this person is in it. Let's go see it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I used to uh, like, there were certain actors that I thought were really good when I was younger. I'd be like, all right, give me all the movies they're in. These days, I'm like, no. Depends oh, who's writing, yeah. directing. Yeah, and the, like in the, the 80s and 90s, it's like, oh shit, a new Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or a new yeah. Stallone movie's come out. It's like, yeah, I want to see that because I like that person. There was know? a period in time where I had seen every Jean Claude Van Damme movie, every single one. <laughs> and, and it made me so happy. Like, that was an achievement. And whenever a new one came out, I watched them. And then it was like, it was somewhere around uh, the hot, the, what was the one that would, where it was at the hockey stadium? Like, that was like the last. Oh, one. yeah, Sudden Death. Sudden Death. Yeah, that was kind of shit. And then after that, they kind of really went downhill. But man, I loved watching like Lionheart and Time Cop and yeah, uh, he had some good ones. Universal Soldier, Bloodsport, Nowhere to Run. Uh, Yeah, just yeah, just uh, I loved those movies, man. They were fun. What happened to fun? Oh yeah, I know. We lost movie um, stars and we lost fun at the same time. When my dad showed me Predator and then revealed once we'd finished it that there was a sequel, I was like ecstatic. And then I found out Arnie wasn't in it, and I was like, "But yeah, but but <laughs> like, but but why? Why would you do that?" I did dad, like. Dad, I why like would you Predator do this to me? Two, though. <laughs> I like I think, Predator Two. I'm not gonna lie. It's no, not thing, Predator I, One. I like but... it. Yeah. I I like uh, Danny Glover as well. Like I, I think he's it's, it's just you know that I, I was I was fucking like eight. <laughs> so I was just like, give me my Arnie. <laughs> When Arnold throws the knife through that dude, <laughs> pins it to the wall, stick around. Stick around. Stick around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you forget like how awesome the first thirty minutes of Predator is before it becomes the horror dude. movie. When it's awesome then too, but it's like it's an action movie and then it becomes a horror movie, and it's so fucking great. Ain't yeah. got time to bleed is one of the like, coolest things you could say, but it's simultaneously <laughs> like I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got time to bleed. But it's like you couldn't imagine anyone but Jesse Ventura delivering a line like that. Like you couldn't imagine an actor nowadays delivering it. It would just be immediately mocked. But like yeah. back then it just kind of was awesome and simultaneously crazy at the same time, you know. Yeah, people aren't allowed to be hilariously over masculine anymore. No, like it, no, it, no. It doesn't it, like, first you can't find the guy because if you do je- notice Jesse Ventura didn't look like the rock. Or like Dave Batista, who we were talking about earlier, like they're all chiseled and like he was just a mountain of mass. He's just like this big thing. And like that was that's the guy you'd expect to be holding the minigun. He wouldn't look like he he went to the gym for 17 hours every day. He's just a big motherfucker who carries around a big gun and shoot shit. It's like yeah. and it's all intentional, I ain't got time right? to bleed. <laughs> that's a, hey, I love that's a good impression. <laughs> um, but I was just gonna say, like that—that's part of like the idea, isn't it? Because he's the uh, the second guy to get knocked out, and they get knocked out really quickly. And it's just like, what? He's gone? Like, just th- this thing is so powerful, it just kicked him out like that. And it's like, yeah, he's yep. dead. The minigun wielder is gone. Um, yeah. Th- that, by the way, that film is the one I always reference when people say like, oh, I hate subversion. It's like you don't. Ryan Johnson just pissed all over it. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Like it was possible to subvert tropes smartly. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, I love the Predator redub where the, the guy's just like, this stuff will make you a goddamn Sexosaurus Rex. Sexosaurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's so good. Uh, all right, next one is uh, Peter, Pizza and Scotch Bonnet. Jesus, Ooh, that's a brave Scotch man Scotch Bonnet right there. peppers are good. You'll get the ring of fire right there. Um, I like the flavor of that pepper, though. It tastes good besides just being hot. Hmm. Uh, That's James what I look Ash- in women. <laughs> <laughs> James Ashton says, "Drinker, have you seen Tar yet? A post woke, or were we all being trolled by the clip that was doing the rounds?" Yes, yeah, so I've seen the clip, um, but then that character is meant to be the antagonist of the movie. So I think what it wants you to believe is that she's in the wrong, and so you shouldn't really listen to what she says. 
Um, that's a, as that's my understanding of it, but I haven't seen Tar, so I couldn't I couldn't give you a proper assessment of the overall film, unfortunately. Um, Paul Anderson says, "Y'all better be uh, good. You're up against Nerdrotic playing Witcher. I mean, well." You know, what can we do? Gary will eventually get through that door and then anything could happen. <laughs> Hell will freeze over. Nothing <laughs> is impossible anymore. <laughs> it's like Gary playing Witcher is on par with us trying to explain pop culture to Sargon. Like, it's just... <laughs> uh, it's a tough road. Uh, John Everett says, A hail drinker and guests have one on me and that was for 50 US dollars. So thank you, man. Very much appreciate that. Uh, the Electron Ninja says, I can't wait until Nick Kidd's Choice Awards will be the most watched awards show on TV. Uh, the Slime will be the new Oscars. Cheers to you and yours. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's where we're heading at the moment. Uh, Bird Up says, Golden Globes were, were more entertaining when post-stroke Dick Clark slurred his way through all the translations. <laughs> Ellie's gay, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Blue Team Epsilon says, have you seen the new Scooby-Doo trailer? Yes, we did talk about that. Velma and Shaggy are black now. Yes, we talked about that. Uh, yet another cultural and multi-generational show updated for modern audiences. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's all funny. of those things and it doesn't even look funny to boot, so... Ugh. I don't... Do kids even... Okay. I have five kids. None of them watch TV. None of them. They all watch... Like, they watch homemade shit on YouTube. They, like, YouTube, watch yeah. these these object shows where, like, it's, like, the characters are, like, towel, wrench, pencil, whatever. Like, I don't even fucking understand them. And th that's the shit that they watch. Or they watch, like, you know, uh, these YouTube content creators who repaint, like, stuffed animals and, and shit like that. None of them sit down and, like, I want to watch the show Velma. That That would be so far from their... Uh, normal behavior that I would be shocked if anything like that happened. I think they made me watch the Steven Universe movie after which oh. I wanted to eat nails but like that's that was years ago and that's the last thing that I remember them referencing that was actually professionally produced. I don't I don't think these guys have any idea what's coming to them. Uh, I, I, I honestly think Velma was made by Mindy Kaling for Mindy Kaling. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'll do great. I'm sure it will just it's gonna blow records away on the <laughs> lower end of things. It's it's gonna be another She Hulk, I think. But yeah, best of luck to them. Um Here's one uh from Casey Boyd, and this is for the whole panel. Uh thoughts on the first Captain America movie. Oh, I loved it. I liked it a lot. Hmm. I, I think uh, my my opinion of it has improved year on year since it came out, I think. Yeah, I look back on it now and it's like, oh gosh, it's just so innocent and so earnest and just so likable. Like compared to like everything that they put out now, it's like, yeah, this is a whole different class of movie. Is, it's a really strong movie in terms of just like, who is Captain America? Who is Steve Rogers? That's what that movie does really well. Yeah. Yep. And it's got Hayley Atwell in it, which is... <laughs> Fantastic. God. <laughs> Top tier. Well yeah. done, Marvel. That was a good bit of casting. Uh, Canon Folder, I'll give me a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, Kevin O'Neill says, Disparu beat me to it at Last Open Bar when he mentioned how multiverse theory has devolved into a cheap writing tool. I'd like to throw time travel into that mix. It used to be cool, but now it's just another tool to bypass any kind of continuity. Very true. Oh, they'll do anything they can to not have to fucking pay attention to rules or canon. Anything. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Vapor says, "I used to love award shows. Now I can tell you exactly who's going to win without having seen the film. It's all about the politics instead of the work. I, I don't doubt that in the slightest." Mm -hmm. um, George the Giant Slayer for a hundred dollars says, "All hail Drinker. What do you think of War of the Rohirrim producer slagging Amazon's rings?" Golden Globes in the toilet, and Marvel casting director says she's pushing forward with intersectional diversity. Hail to Drinker, Mahler, Echo, and Rakita. So, yeah, kind of a lot to pack up. Uh, uh, sorry, unpack there. Uh, what do you think of War of the Rohirrim's producer slagging Amazon's uh, Rings of Power? I, I haven't seen that they had. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't know are... there was a War of the Rohirrim. Yeah, so it's this weird licensing issue where some of it sits within. Oh, Christ, who even owns the rights to the 
Is it Warner? I think so. Yeah, I think Warner owned the rights to the Lord of the Rings on TV. Amazon owned the rights to the appendices from fucking Silmar Silmarillion or something, that which is what allowed them to make Rings of Power. Uh, and so they've each got, you know, the ability to make things in the respective eras of Tolkien. And that's what they're doing. The the War of the Rohirrim. I don't, I don't know much about it beyond that, though. Like, I've not seen anything really about it. No one's talked about it. So I don't yeah, know I never even heard for. of it. This is the first I've I've even heard of it existing. Um, so maybe it'll be good. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Marvel best we can muster for anything new these days. Maybe yeah. it'll be good. Maybe uh, the Marvel <laughs> casting director is pushing forward with intersectional diversity. Yay! Because that's a winning strategy. Um, yeah. Can it's they? Is. Are they ever gonna like figure it out? Like, are they ever gonna go? You know what? Like. If we just didn't do this one time and try it out, and they make a bunch of money, like could they could they do that? Like could they just fig just for once? They they'd have to do it, but they'd have to then pair it with a good script and good director, but not yeah push that stuff. And so those things to all align at the same time is quite a rare rare commodity these days. And yeah, it, it feels like it's less and less likely to happen. I think probably behind the scenes they privately know that they need to do it they just won't they'll never admit it publicly because it would be an admission of defeat yeah uh, so. well i'm hoping they'll like just silently do it one time just be like here you go like, we'll, i mean we'll maybe this yeah one out. You, you see things like no way home which was essentially just a, a message free movie that was just about you know having a bit of fun like we're gonna get a bunch of different spider-men together and uh you know do a multiverse story should be good fun and I it would was. I would go further. Drinkers say it was a message in there, but it was a super fundamental one. It was like if you do the right thing and it has bad consequences, that doesn't mean you did the wrong thing. Like uh, he chose to try and save the the bad guys, right? And then it ends up costing him his mum when she tells him, like, "No, don't worry, you still did the right thing. You tried to save people's lives." You know, that's I think that's the overall point of that movie. The other Peters tell him like that was a good choice. You did well, and that that's fundamental Peter Parker shit, right? He doesn't. Doesn't kill people. He doesn't give up on people. He tries to save them. Mm -hmm. You know, because the the film is like he comes close to falling down the same almost uh, rabbit hole that uh, Andrew Andrew Spider Man says that he kind of did that he got dark sort of thing. Yeah. So you know, um, and I and I think that oh sorry his aunt not his, it, she was pretty much his mum <laughs> like the, the yeah. Of, um, but yeah, uh, I I usually see like the ones that come across a lot less preachy when they appeal to like a fundamental human nature thing that a lot of us will be completely on board with. Like, yeah, do good, you know. It's not, but but try and have more meaning than just do better. <laughs> like a certain Falcon the Winter Soldier thing, even though I don't really get started the fucking messages that were in that season. Oh god, yeah. I I, I, think I, I couldn't the... watch that shit. Yeah, you missed out on absolutely nothing. It was I'll make a note of I'll have to force you to watch it someday. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for you though. I'll do it for you. <laughs> uh Brenton Palmer says, A Kiwi on the stream. Did you know as? Uh love your work, chaps. Thank you very much, man. Um Fang forty sorry, forty five ACP says uh, Hail Drinker, Avatar success is actually mostly due to overseas sales. It is far behind Top Gun in the US and the UK. Check out Box Office Mojo or similar. Yeah, I think the difference is it got a Chinese release, didn't it? So that's got to be a massive uh, bonus for it. But um, yeah, like the the last time we did an open bar, Moller and I were scratching our heads trying to puzzle out why, why the well, fuck yeah, Avatar but... 2 is doing well. We don't understand it. <laughs> And like, you know, I, I know all the arguments about how good it looks or how much of like the amount of effort that's gone into it. It's not just a green screen and all that stuff. I just mean like, how did this happen with a story that meh? Like that that's the one that you know, people are wanting to rewatch and re-going. But like, maybe it is as simple as it just the experience of watching it is enough to get people back. It doesn't actually matter what happens in it. I think, I think so. I think be, they, yeah. they just want to see how like Avatar 1 was pretty. Let's see what they've done to make Avatar 2 pretty 10 years later, right? Like, how good can this movie look? Would be, that'd be the only reason I would be at all interested in seeing it is how good can they make this shit look? Do you think I'll the other, like, Coppola and uh, Scorsese are like, Cameron, how did you do that? <laughs> like, you're, you're, <laughs> the fuck? 
I don't know. I'll, I'll I do. Uh, what I do know is uh, I went to, I, is it Universal or it's one of the Disney things where they have that like Avatar ride. That thing is actually really yeah. fucking cool. Like, I'm not going to lie. That was that was an awesome ride. A lot of fun. So, I mean, that's that's within Disney. Uh, yeah. That's oh, yeah. Like yeah. So that Animal that, Kingdom. I think they've got that there. I don't know why it's in the Animal Kingdom, not like Hollywood. It's probably just where they had space. Yeah, know. it's like mm, fuck it, put it in there. Yeah, I, I yeah. went there and and rode that thing, and it was actually that's fucking cool, man. Like that. <laughs> the the last time I was there is like the wait time was like 150 minutes or something, and I was like, nah, it's not worth waiting three hours for. <laughs> we had the uh, if you if you pay way too much money, you can do the where they walk you through the park and they take you places and they'll take you right to the front of the line. It's great. That's what you got to do. No, oh, nice. Yeah, you got to do the tour. Yeah. Uh, the next one is, oh, Waylon Pacifus, who says, "Would you choose the Batman or Batman Begins? Which would you prefer?" I haven't seen Batman Begins in long enough that I, I can't remember a lot of it, so I need to rewatch that before I can answer. But I remember liking Batman Begins quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think you know they're both good. Like if if you could cut out the last half hour from the Batman, I would choose that. Um, as it stands, it's like God, it's so bloated. And so unnecessary at the end, but I couldn't I watch Batman Begins Batman. because it was three hours long, and I just said I'm Wait, not going to do that. Do you mean the Batman or the the Batman? The That's Batman, right. yeah, yeah. So I take Batman Begins by default because I'm not watching fucking three hour movies anymore. I think ba even Batman Begins is a fairly hefty movie, isn't it? It's well over two right. hours. Can't yeah, remember, but I watched but... it before that policy, so it gets grandfathered <laughs> in. Uh, okay, <laughs> I uh, chat seems to be on Batman Begins' side. Out of the two. two hours and 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, people like Liam Neeson. Um, Rosh okay. Al <laughs> yeah. John the Man Good says uh, So Isom gets big and Ripperverse comes to you to create a cinematic universe. How would you do it? Oh my God. This gives us a challenge because none of us really know the, the sort of lore behind the Ripperverse. Yeah, at that point, you'd have to get you on the story team, and then it probably wouldn't be something that you choose. It would be you and him and many others. The big plan, right? Because it has huge implications. There. Unless you want to do it the Marvel way, fucking whatever. Just do whatever you want, guys. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, if you look to the early stages of how they did things, they probably did it right. It's like, yeah. okay, introduce each character, give them their own movie, like so that they're well-established, then do a big team-up movie, and then break up you know, for their own separate phase two and, and start to bring in new people and then have another team up like that all worked great for like the first three phases so yeah that's probably this how is do such it. an easy answer though you just have the rip a multiverse and then you make a movie and uh if the movie has some sort of problem you just pretend it was part of a different universe and it's fine or you go grab a character from the other universe and bring him in or grab all of the characters from the other universes and bring them in it's like jet lee's the one but more gay did you? Did I'm you gonna write do... She-Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> I did. My 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 strategy now is just gonna be like anytime someone points out like a character did something in your book that made no sense, I'll just say, uh, "Well, it's like glass onion. Everyone's dumb." And so that's my explanation for everything. Need, you need to add on to that. Like you're kind of dumb for not knowing that they yeah. were dumb. So. <laughs> you you just didn't understand. How embarrassing for you. Yeah. Uh, Waylon Pacifus says, "Any advice for starting a review channel? This is the, this is our chance to impart some wisdom, gentlemen. How do you review things?" Uh, Moore's Moore's advice will be make it really long and detailed. <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say, don't make it short. That's all. Okay, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> it's a completely different piece of advice. <laughs> To do something different than every other reviewer does. I mean, the, you look. There's there's a ton of really great reviews, uh, so you can find uh, some sort of niche. Look at uh, a bunch of them that exist, and then take kind of pointers, not stealing their like work or their their concept, but realize the uniqueness of each of them. I love watching like Razor Fist's reviews of '80s movies that he used to do. They were so fucking good. Like he just nailed them. And uh, I didn't, it didn't matter that I've seen all those movies like a hundred times. I wanted to hear what Razors had to say about each one of them. So um, find stuff like that. Find something that makes like either the subject matter you're reviewing unique, or if you're going to do like contemporary stuff, which is also good, make your voice unique in some way. But either way, just care about what you're talking about. 
whether you know whether you oh, yeah. hate it or love it or whatever just like have some passion have some interest in it uh the worst thing you can do is just be reviewing something that you don't give a shit about but it's like well i feel like it's popular or something so i should talk about it because yeah it will come through in what you do nothing is popular if you're not into it yeah uh danny cool says drinker i got a pop a bottle of jura for christmas is it okay to use as a mixer <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or is that a bit of Ryan Johnson? Ponzi and takes away the flavor. <laughs> Cheers. Don't fucking mix that with anything. No. <laughs> Enjoy you, your Jura, man. <laughs> you, you drink it neat or you don't drink it at all. Like, that's that's really the way with malt whiskeys. So, yeah, don't mix it. Uh, Kevbot says, Hail, it's me again, back with more happy hour suggestions that you didn't ask for. I think you should tackle the Batman films. The 1981, sorry, 1989 Tim Burton. Of course... Uh, but not sure which other ones. I'll leave that up to you and Mauler. Cheers. I would genuinely love to do a review of the Tim Burton Batman movies. Both of them. I because... recently watched Returns of the Free, and I'm not sure, but I think it might be my favorite Batman film, uh, which I, is I... bold. When I watched the first one as well, I'm like, God, like looking at the context of the time, it's such a perfect adaptation from a comic book. It just like you can feel how this would be presented in comic book cells, you know. It it's just they nailed it, really nailed it. Really nailed the about, characters. You talking about eighty nine when you said that? Yeah. Really? Because yeah. <laughs> what I what I often hear from people is how they like the film, but it is not Batman. That's what I hear. I I, I don't know. Like I, whether it's just the framing of the scenes, whether it's uh, like the way Keaton like portrays himself whether it's you know like uh all the the sort of shootouts with uh with jack before he becomes the joker and stuff i just uh i think it looks great i i you know not being a comic book expert i can't like say like is definitively the best adaptation you could get but like for me it just seems like a great um yeah a, a great port over of that comic book style into a movie format i liked it personally yeah no well, I, I love it I just remember everybody liking it when it came out. Like everybody liked Batman 89. Like my parents liked it. They were not comic book people. I liked it. Uh, you know, my relatives liked it. Everybody went and watched it and, uh, and everybody enjoyed it. It was, it was this weird time when a comic book movie came out, everybody was cool with it. And then uh, that kind of like went away for a while after that. But yeah, it's like you had that brief spell of like fairly serious comic book movies that were dark and broody and interesting uh, i think you had the crow and then basically a, a big long stretch of like not much until you got to something like blade which was like four or five years later yeah blade was Quite, late 90s yeah so a kind of a kind of a long dry spell really in comic book movies um but yeah i miss that look i miss that aesthetic um Richard Stamets says, Hail Drinker and Friends. I'm not an author, but I occasionally work on a novel in my free time. What is your recommendation for when and if I finish it? Is there somewhere an amateur submits their work? Cheers. Um, just agents, I suppose. Literary agents is where you want to go to in the first instance to try and get someone to represent you. If it's good, then one of them, one of them will pick you up and start trying to get you sold to publishers. Um it's the standard route. I mean, failing that, you can always self-publish through like Amazon, do print on demand or whatever. There's like a million services for that nowadays. It's so easy to get published. Um, yeah, that would be my, my advice. Uh, Craig Kennedy gave me a super sticker. So thanks, man. And Wayland Bacephus says, they used to say that you could become an actor or an activist, but when you're facing a woke mob, what's the difference? Jack Nicholson, probably. Um, yeah, nowadays... You, if you're going to be one, you have to be the other, I suppose. Because um, even if you're silent about it, you start getting accusations thrown at you, don't you? It's like, ah. Uh, oh, didn't, didn't Kurt Russell nail it? He's one of the people who nails it, right? Yes, he nails it. You, you he's like, yeah, we're, out there. yeah, but he's like a different generation. You know, he's he's older, he's established. You know, now it's like he, he can say stuff like that. But if he was just starting out, he wouldn't be able to have that attitude. No, you know, it would be like, well, <laughs> you're you're not towing the line. You're not saying the correct things. Like, well, we won't be hiring you anymore. Like, that's that's pretty much the way it goes. I think. Can you imagine a world without Kurt Russell, like a, a Hollywood where Kurt Russell didn't exist? God, it would be so fucking depressing. 
I, I don't want to think about that world. Why are you trying to make <laughs> us think of that world, Nick? What are you yeah. doing? <laughs> Imagine uh, a world without Kurt Russell. Uh, <laughs> just screaming. Yeah. Patty P says, uh, Good day, drinker, and co hail from Down Under. With Marvel failing and fantasy IPs being destroyed fast, do you think Woke Hollywood will come for the historical epics next? If so, I can't wait to see an all-female gladiator movie with lead Tessa Thompson. Insert Sam Neill scream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, redo what's... Troy again, but at this time Achilles is a woman. What's the net? Yeah, what's the next genre for them to plunder? I suppose. Everyone's waiting for that Back to the Future man. Oh, sorry, oh. that's not a genre, but you know what I mean. Yeah, like, God, <laughs> don't. Oh. Don't well, you, you know, you got us thinking about a world with like Kurt Russell, and now we're talking about a world with a remade Back to the Future. Well, yeah, there's that. I think but they would imagine re a remade female-led Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> I'd assume they would go the whole sequel remake with Back to the Future. Doc, if Christopher Lloyd's still around, they'll have him come in and usher in the new. It, it would be a female protagonist, and she would be going back in time. And she'd invent her own like upgraded DeLorean or something just like and she'd be like 12 years old and she would it, invent it that's herself. it she would make it and she would ask him like about his and she'd be like how did you how did you account for the blah 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 blah, blah? and he'd be like well uh, I didn't and then she'd be like oh well I have yeah <laughs> yeah she, no she would say well I'm sure you tried your best yeah that'll be it <laughs> god the thing is, we're mocking this, but that's exactly how it would play out if they had to do this. And so you do the great right. Scott, you've done it. You know, it'd, it'd be like, yeah, and he'd just be sitting there having to suck her dick the whole time about how smart she was. Oh, Jesus. Yep. I hate everything that has happened in the past three minutes. It's like this hypothetical film that we've concocted in our heads just makes us hate Hollywood even more because we know it would happen. <laughs> yeah, the problem is that film's now on a four-year timeline for release. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Uh, Will Brog Brogdon says, Why does Echo's arm color match his walls? I don't know. That was a weird thing with this camera, I think, where it was uh, it was more. Yeah, he had, he had only color in the middle of his frame. Like yeah. Right here, that was it. And then a filter that, that grayed out everything else. I, it was weird because his arm was resting up there and it sort of blended in with his background. And it was like, for a moment, I was like, shit, is he actually like missing an arm? <laughs> like, I just never knew about it. <laughs> then he moved it slightly. I was like, ah, it's okay. Um, ah, Jane McLean and Die Hard. No! <laughs> no, yeah, that's the thing though. They, they wouldn't have a female character get injured the way he does, like you know, with his yeah. foot all cut up and stuff. It's like she would just kill everyone immediately and just triumph easily, just, you know. And they couldn't have her in a vest because that would be showing too much flesh, so she'd have to be in a, a fur coat or something like that. God knows. It's always funny seeing just how fucking roughed up. John McClane was at the end of every Die Hard movie. Yeah. It's just well, the, yeah, he's barely walking at the end of the, the first one. You know, it's just great. Like Indiana Jones. He gets his ass handed to him so much in his movies. Still yep. wins, but man, does he get beaten up. I, I did the bit that always makes me laugh is when he gets whacked in the chin by the mirror. Yeah, in the first one, it's just so like the the scream that you hear from him is so well done. <laughs> Uh, every Eddie Brooks says, Drinker, please do a review on The Banshees of Inishirin. A uh, great film that actually deserved best comedy at the Globes. Hollywood has taste. Who knew? Uh, I've heard nothing but great things about that movie. So it's Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson again, isn't it? It is. Just the the dynamic McDonough. duo. Yeah. Uh, and Atab says, uh, Drinker, could you talk about your project with our boy Zach? How you guys linked up and why you chose Troutman, etc. Uh, yeah, so this is the um, comic book that I've done. Um, so it's like a prequel to the Rambo movies. It's about Colonel Troutman when he was like a young soldier in Korea. And uh, yeah, I was approached by by Zach. Um, he had this initial idea. I think it was through Az, actually, who recommended him. He basically said, this guy wants to get in touch. I can vouch for him. And I said, okay, I'll talk to him. And uh, he presented this idea, and I said, sure, I'd quite like to try something like that. I might try my hand at writing a comic book, you know, script. Uh, and so we, we got a contract sorted out. I did it, and, uh, you know, it went down pretty well. And now it, here it is. It's like a fleshed out, con you know, comic that's uh, ready to go. So that's a, a little thing that I've done. So I've now done 
novels, comics, and I'm trying to get my my first movie like completed and done. So hey, you know it's going okay. I just need to do a video game next. Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy up the rights to Resident Evil and like make a new game of that, and then do a movie adaptation that's actually halfway decent. You know? oh, I was please, thinking like please do critical drink a simulator and just you get progressively drunker in a theater. <laughs> <and just> <laughs> Drunk man simulators. It's like you've got to like practice walking and stuff, you know. <laughs> Can you navigate the popcorn during the movie? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I probably I'll finish up there. I think because like there's still a, a bunch of super chats, but we will we will finish those ones up in a super chat catch up. But uh, yeah, Nick, I want to thank you, man, for coming on for this. I appreciate oh, it's my it. pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is a blast. It's been a pleasure to see you enjoying that damn fine whiskey there. And, uh, yeah. I can yeah, tell I think you've I've been had, enjoying it. I've had a decent amount. I'm like, I got two more shows today. Hmm. Oh damn, yeah. <laughs> You're gonna be lit for those ones, man. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> uh, and for everyone that's that's joined us for this, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the awesome super chats that have come in. Like again, you guys are super generous, and we appreciate it here. It's what keeps us going. It keeps the lights burning. And it keeps the critical doggo burning with excitement, as you can see. Like, wait, are you still alive or what? I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you for that, guys. The the super chats that we've missed out on, we will obviously do a catch up stream in a couple of days just to get them done as well. Um, but yeah, uh, that's it for me. Mauler, do you have anything to add for our lovely audience? There wasn't going to be an EFAP this Saturday. It was going to be a break. We said we needed a break. But then, as you guys may know, a video popped out that is of interest to us. So we're getting the crew back. The Gloss Onion crew is coming back this Saturday for a round two. So join us for that. Other than that, great stream, fellas. Love love chatting with you, Nick. It's always a pleasure. Nice. Yeah, man. It's great. Alrighty. Well, that's all we got for today. So go away now. <laughs>